quality of the sound is audible, but not perfect. So Absolutely. please uh, put a headset or even earphones with the mic, because yesterday we had really many, many issues regarding this kind of sound and interpreters really suffered a lot. So please stick I to the rules. <laughs> this, I know it's annoying, but you, you should really have a headset with the mic. And also many people yesterday spoke with a, uh, a camera which was not open. I really encourage you to, to show you when you speak for the interpreters, but also for your general public, because seeing a, only a photo or a black screen uh, really doesn't uh, make uh, communication very smooth and uh, interesting. So interpreters need to, to see you while you speak, okay? Absolutely, thank you so much for that and apologies for the difficulties in, in the past days. Maybe Jim, we can I can, I can hear an echo when you speak, for example, now. I don't know why. Maybe you have another computer. Just oh no, I have. Or... I have a headset on. I'm sorry you hear an echo, but it's okay. I'm not going to be speaking today. I'm just here to okay. facilitate uh, okay, okay. technical functions. So thank God. I apologize for the echo, but Jim, let's maybe encourage participants to turn on their webcam for also for the interpreters. Um, we uh, we understand if if participants feel freed also not to, unfortunately, either because of their internet connection or because they're shy, but it would be nice if we could add that to the opening statements. And it's 10.03, okay. so I think we can start. I will mute myself, and good luck, everyone. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. So here we are. We're in the last day of the World Food Forum in the Youth Assembly, but this is just the beginning of a beautiful journey, as one of our colleagues said yesterday. And so we're very happy to be here, to be with you all. And um, just to kick it off and break the ice, um, you could go on to Mentimeter. Um, just so that we want to know where you're coming from, all right? Before we get there, let me just state down the rules of, uh, of this uh, meeting, of, of this session, really, and to say that there are going to be, um, there is interpretation happening behind the scenes for you guys. So if, you, if you're looking for interpretation, go to the interpretation button that you would find down below on your screen. And this is interpreted in the six UN languages of, of the UN, all right? And so just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Jim. I'll be your moderator for today. And uh, I chair the Youth Alliance and also work closely with Jenna and the rest of my colleagues in the Youth Action Assembly documents. Um, so very happy to be here with you all. Now, before, we also, uh, before I also forget, Later down the uh, during the session, you're going to be able to participate as well, and we'd love to get your contributions and interventions. And to do that, you're a, you can click the raise hand button, and then we'd promote you to panelists for you to speak. We really encourage that you also open your video, um, if possible, and if it's okay with you, that when you speak, we can see you as well. So we'd love that. We'd love to get your intervention and we'd love to see you and your beautiful smiles. And so with that also, along with that, you can also utilize the chat box. So go on to the chat box, use the Q&A button as well. So if you have questions, you can use the Q&A button, you can use the chat box and you can share your ideas, raise your questions. Um, if you have comments, do utilize these buttons so that we can capture all your interventions and inputs and feedback, and we'd be we'll be putting you know consolidating these to help uh, better and polish the documents that we will be discussing or taking into consideration for the Youth Action Assembly. All right, is everybody good with that? Can I can I have some thumbs up? 
Thumbs up. Yeah. All right. All right. I only see Jen on my screen, but yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay. So before we go into the meat and to and dive into the discussions, let's go and let's go to menti.com. And you can go on to uh, one six, uh, type in the code 1634. 2324. So I think that should be 1634-2324. And um, type in which country you're joining from. And we'd love to see. We have people from Brazil, from Egypt coming in. Hello, hello. Good afternoon from the Philippines. Good morning, wherever you are. Good evening. And good day to everybody, basically. We have people from Brazil, from Egypt. Anybody else coming from what country? All right. Give you some time to, to put in your, your countries, where you're joining from. Again, that's menti.com. And then you type in the code, which you can see in the chat box, which is 1634-2324. So you can go in there. I see we also have... Palguni from India, and um, we have, of course, from Italy, and of course, from Germany with Jenna, me from the Philippines. We have other people coming in as well. So we have India, Brazil, Egypt. Where is everybody else coming in from? Let's go, let's go. Yeah, Jim, I think that the Menti may not be loading completely. I'm seeing some answers in the oh, chat wow. okay. that um, aren't appearing in Menti. And for example, my answer in Menti isn't appearing. Um, but we do see some ah. great submissions in the chat also from All India, right. also from Egypt. Again, so we have several folks tuning in from those countries. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jenna. Yes. Thanks for pointing that out. I think there may be some issues on that one. But yeah, go ahead to the chat box if it's not working. Go ahead to the chat box here on Zoom and then type in which country you're coming in from so that we can also acknowledge you. France, hello from Mauritius. Hello, hello. Italy. I love that Italy with an H. Okay. From Georgia, from Portugal and Canada. All right. All countries coming in, coming in. Italy. Hello, hello, buongiorno. Um, I only know a few. Um, ça va for our colleagues from France. Hello. All right, and I'm coming in from the Philippines. Okay, all right. So we have, we have quite a few people here already here coming from different countries. And this is going to be very interesting because we've talked a lot yesterday and we've gone in depth into each of the sessions of the, the documents of the youth action assembly the youth mechanism the youth action compendium the youth action plan and really to bring that all together we're going to talk about the ways forward so um yeah i have maria's hands up maria hi yeah just very quickly um it appears that we might have a technical problem for interpretation so just to make sure that all of our participants can follow the session um i'd suggest if we can just take a break or okay. if we have a video that we can show or something while we wait that our fantastic interpretation team um can get back just so all that right. we remain inclusive with the conversation yeah Absolutely. Okay. Let's so we're going to take a quick break, five minutes, um, just so that we have our interpretations up and running for all of us here and that we're all going to be on the same page. Yeah? Yeah. Don't go anywhere, people. I mean, if Don't you go, go, go get a Stay coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to pull we'll up some right videos back. for you guys within that span of time. All right. Let me just... Quickly. Hi, Jim. Good morning. This is Matteo. How are you today? Do you have a video ready, Matteo? I always have a video ready. All right. Perfect. <laughs> are you tuning in from Italy, Matteo? 
Yes, of course. Okay. Of course. Buongiorno. Buongiorno to you. <laughs> okay. So while we have that, go into the chat oh, yeah. also. And um, just continue saying, where are you coming from? All right, let me try to share the video. This is the video that I was trying to play yesterday uh, from the Isaac outgoing and incoming president that wanted to salute all the youth that are participating in the World Food Forum. And yesterday when I tried to do my computer crash, so maybe I can try again and see if I have a better luck this morning. Okay. Let's see. I'm Evan Betty, the global president at ISAC. And I'm Louise Kim, global president-elect at ISAC for 2022. At ISAC, we empower young people to become value-driven leaders who positively impact the world around them. And we're grateful to be a part of the World Food Forum that is actively seeking youth participation to transform the agri-food systems. 821 million, or even easier for you, one in nine people around the world are undernourished. By the year 2030, we are estimated to meet the Sustainable Development Goal target by a margin of 660 million people. Which is why we need to act today, now. As I said, we have already partnered with other organizations such as Electra's Food Foundation, with whom we created the Feed the Planet initiative, teaching young people about sustainable eating through digital campaigns, lessons on sustainability, and a clear framework for measuring impact in social projects. We believe that we, as young people, have the responsibility to create a long-lasting, positive impact on our own lives, our communities, and the world at large. We trust that we will drive and shape the future with our passion, dynamism, and innovative spirit. We would like to encourage young people to actively participate in engagements such as the World Food Forum to build and create a better, better, better future and a better food future, more importantly. Be part of the solution, play your part in your communities, and also make sure to participate in events such as this one, where young people can be at the table, bringing their perspectives to decision makers and to the people that really matter, that can really make a difference in this problem that matters so much to all of us and that is relevant for all of us. Thank you so much for listening to us and have a very good World Food Forum. Great, okay. thanks for that. Thanks, Mateo. All right, again, just to reiterate, we have some technical issues for the moment. So we won't be diving into the discussion yet and not until we have our interpretation services up and ready to go. So for now, we're just taking a quick break so that the, these technical issues would be addressed. Um, we'd love to see uh, you know, all of us listening in and being on the same page. So I think with that, we're also, I'm, I also have a video ready here, Mateo. Um, this Please is go going to be this is the Foodicons uh, video, which will be all which will have a launch later today as well. So let me just share my screen and uh, pull that up. I think that we cannot hear the audio for this video. Yeah, Jim, when, when you, sorry. Can you, can you, yeah, thank you. When you share the screen, also share the audio. That'd be great. I did choose the audio as well. Let me do that again. Sorry.
you're going to create a truly global food culture where everyone is represented, the first thing you probably have to do is come up with a language. Foodicons is a way of overcoming at least partially linguistic and geographic barriers. It's an ambitious project meant to serve people throughout and across the food system, from consumers to professionals of all kinds. What we decided to do was draft designers and food system experts from all over the world to join us in that journey to create a truly universal language that could be shared by everybody in our food system. I really like this double uh, mission here. If I teach you that type of language, I may speak English. Even if you see one particular icon, we are literally in that same language. Yo creo que es super relevante, es importante tener una alternativa más de de un lenguaje más allá de del escrito o del hablado. Y por eso yo creo que creo que los iconos son una parte importante de la cultura actual. Foodicons has a process where artists and designers create icons but then go through a series of steps where they receive feedback from design experts but also food system experts. These designers have done a, a terrific job trying to interpret it in a way that is both simple but yet informative. Not only are we crowdsourcing these icons from people all over the, the world but they're all going to be open source. There's going to be no limitations on anyone in the world using them for essentially any kind of practice. I think timing is everything. And I think this is that moment where people want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves and want to contribute to something that has a higher degree of social. It's really important to me to work for something greater than just myself, my country, or my culture. And this happens what we do here um, bring value for everybody in the world. It's clear that there's a visual language evolving that is teaching us how all these terms can relate to each other. And the most exciting part of this project has yet to happen. And that's seeing how people all over the world use them. We expect to see uses we haven't even imagined as people communicate how they work and eat to all kinds of stakeholders. Our mission at the World Food Forum is to support and empower the next generation to create a better food future for the world. And to do that, we need a language that all people can use, a visual language like this. All right, so we're still waiting on the the technical issues. All right, I think it's crucial that we need to wait for the interpretation services so that we're all on the same page for everybody. And so we're going to give them enough time. Do we take a break uh, for a few more minutes? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we would suggest that we break until um, 10.30, just so participants have a idea of a timeline, and then we'll check back in um, to see if the interpretation hub is ready to go and solve their challenges, their technical challenges. So grab a coffee, grab a tea, grab a water, whatever you like, um, and join us back in 10 minutes. Hopefully we're able to continue with our lovely interpretation. So don't go away. We'll be back in just 10 minutes. Absolutely. And yeah. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. All right. See you all in 10 minutes, guys.
Hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you to our technical team and also our interpreters. Um, we truly appreciate your work and the, the things that you do to keep the meetings smooth and running and for everybody to be um, on the same page. So now we have all of our technical difficulties addressed. We're now going to dive in, right? And so for those who, are just, who just came in, please go into the chat box. Tell us where you're joining from. We'd love to know where you're tuning in from, where you're joining in from. Uh, go ahead to the chat box and do that, please. All right, with that, I'm going to hand over to our colleague here, uh, who is with me here right now, Jenna, to talk about the ways forward in, oops, my bad, something wrong with the screen. Okay. Yeah, I think this Let is from just... the Mentimeter, so we can just go to the next slide because we already did the Mentimeter. Yeah, I'm going straight to that. This is okay. So we're here. Perfect. Great. All right. So for this part of the session, we're going to talk about the way forward for the Youth Action Assembly, as well as the documents that we're um talked about in breadth and detail yesterday. And for that, I'm going to welcome to the floor uh, my colleague, Jenna, to talk to, to do that. So Jenna, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you so much for your good moderation um, through the unexpected te technical difficulties. Thank you so much to our lovely interpreters that are really facilitating this whole process and helping us make this inclusive. I know it's a bit stressful when something doesn't go as planned. So thank you so, so much for all your hard work. My name is Jenna Tesdall. I'm the director of the Youth Network Young Professionals for Agricultural Development. I think you've seen my face a couple times over the past day, if you have been tuning in. So I thank you so much for those of you who are returning based on the sessions that were held in the past couple days. If you weren't in the sessions over the past couple days, I'll just give a brief overview of what was discussed. So we discussed three documents that are part of the Youth Action Assembly. So there's a compendium as the first one, which is really an analytical summary of youth statements, which have happened over the past year and a half or two years about food and agricultural systems. And that scientific analysis of these different written youth statements now has resulted in the compendium, which should be a document which we can refer to when we say, what are youth priorities, right? So it's not a political position statement, right? Because it hasn't been negotiated, um, but it is could be a basis in the future for some type of statement, right? That the Youth Action Assembly could make together. And so this is kind of the beauty of this document and it can develop into future versions. And so that's what we wanna talk about in this session is how do we move forward with these documents? So first there was a compendium that was discussed. Secondly, we had the governance document and the governance document is a zero draft as well. All of these documents are zero drafts. So you should contribute to them, give feedback either through the sessions that happened in the past days, but also through the written form which has been passed around and we can also perhaps pass it to you all in the chat again. It was also in a World Food Forum newsletter and I know it will be posted on the World Food Forum website so that you can give your written feedback on these documents. So with that aside, the governance document, the second document is to really say how this body should work together. What rules govern our teamwork together so that we can 
work together to be as inclusive as we really are setting out to be and to really have many eyes on this document so that the intent of including as many youth as want to be involved is really made a reality through that governance document so that we can work together to work on policy issues, et cetera, et cetera, whatever we decided that we're gonna put our hands on as a group. Then third is the action track. And the action track is really that beautiful vision of the future for World Food Forum. What do we want World Food Forum to grow into, to evolve into? What do we want to accomplish together with this body? What is its added value? And so this is for all you dreamers out there, all you folks who like to think big, who like to be have your vision in these type of groups. This is the spot for you to contribute and to continue working, dreaming, and putting those projects that you have on the ground really into a bigger vision as well. So this is the action track. And now the way forward, really what we will propose is to form working groups to work on each of these three documents to bring them to life, to make them, to bring them out of the zero draft into a, hopefully a first draft, maybe a second draft, and then finally a final draft. Um, and that also these working groups can consult with their constituencies as well. So I know some of us are here today representing maybe an organization or a group of people who are interested in the World Food Forum. And we need to go back and consult with our constituencies as well about what they think about these documents and really have some of those more intimate discussions in our groups that maybe it's more difficult to have over a webinar or over, um, an internet connection, for example, or just with people that we don't know as well, right? So take these documents back to your constituencies when you are working in these working groups and after these sessions. That is the invitation that we have for all of you. So we've also said many times throughout the last two days that you are welcome to sign up for these working groups. We want you, all of you here today, if you're interested, if you want to be involved, if you want to give your input, please sign up for a working group. And we will put the link to the working group form, sign up form in the chat. Yes, fantastic. And you can also use the QR code on your screen, but you can also get in touch with us via email at you, at youthaction at worldfoodforum.org. And so those are all ways in case perhaps Google Forms doesn't work in your locality. Like for example, I know that it, um, Google services are not um, functioning in China, for example, send us an email. We're also super open to that. If we could advance to the next slide, that would be fantastic. And so this is just a brief summary of what could be topics for the working group. So we really do expect probably that you all are interested in being involved in working groups about one of these three documents, the compendium, the youth mechanism, um, the action track, but perhaps others. Certainly during the discussion yesterday, I heard that folks are interested in certain topic areas. And so that could also be an interesting way to form a working group together with people who are interested in a thematic focus. So all this is open to you. It's up to you to create, and it can be as much and as big as you can dream it to be. And so with that, we'd like to invite also you all into discussion about what you would like to see these working groups accomplish, to just do a small brainstorming session with all of you. And so if you would like to make an intervention like we have before, please raise your hand. We can promote you to panelist. And for our interpretation team, please have headphones in. And if you can, and if you're comfortable, please turn your camera on because that also helps our interpretation team, but it also helps your colleagues who are listening in to get a more full picture of this communication that we're trying to engage in here. So we really encourage you to now come in, express your interest in these working groups and maybe your hopes for what you would like to see these working groups really accomplish.
I see a hand raised from Amira. We can promote Hello. her. Yep. Okay, Amira is going to be promoted to panelist, make an intervention. Yes, definitely. So thank you um, for your patience while we promote you to panelists. And those of you who are also interested, or if you have questions about how you envision these working groups working, definitely chime in. This is like the space for you to say, how do we want to move forward with the World Food Forum and kind of create that together? There she is. Hi, Amira. Hi, Jim. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> good, good morning. Good. Yes, everything is good. Uh, actually, I'd love to talk about the action plan. I, um, I dream. I dream of a world uh, of zero hunger. This is my first, which I think that uh, I'm trying. I tried to work for it for a long time. Uh, even with myself or researchers or national organizations because uh, there's nothing wor worse in the world than um, people uh, who can't access to food every day. And I love also to see um, a healthy young. We are as young need to understand uh, the, um, the importance of uh, nutrition and healthy food need to um, valuable it and need to uh, change our lives by uh, by change our diet uh, so that's what i dream to see it i dream to see everyone aware of this i dream to connect all as a language uh, to be all on the same vibes all over the world uh, so that's uh, as a start and then uh, see what's coming else. <laughs> that's it for now. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Thank you so if much. I could come in, if I could come in and do a follow-up on that intervention you just made, Amira, like I know that that's what you're hoping to do and achieve. And together in the context of the Youth Action Assembly, the World Food Forum, how do you see or what is the best way forward for you in terms of like operationalizing that, engaging that, what kind of working groups would be in, uh, you know, very crucial to, to, to put together so that that dream is realized, yeah? So I think maybe more on how do you see it as a way forward, working closely with people from around the world in the context of the World Food Forum. So yeah, we'd love to okay. get your ideas on that. Okay, I believe that every land in this world have a blessing. So I believe that every nation have something we could share together. Uh, this this something already I'm going to farming through this or food through this because that is the language that we all as humans know exactly that we are talking every day. So if we could share this through science, uh, through our um, uh, daily habits, uh, through um, uh, our beliefs, uh, through our um, uh, our culture, and what we dream to uh, to inherit uh, our next generations, if we could share all of this and um, put it in a draft put it uh, in an action plan, uh, uh, create a harmony in all of this and complete each other with everything that we have. Uh, I think we could uh, make a circle uh, where we could complete each other. Uh, so uh, I'm seeing after that a bright future for all of us. <laughs> I think it would be right if we be able to do this 
through conversation, of course, and sharing our knowledge. Everyone's work, when we share it and uh, create the harmony and the action plan through it and put it in a draft, I think we could be able to do something great. And of course, supporting each other on the land. Everyone going to the land to work, if we support each other with the potential of each other, through the great thing we you are doing right now, the word is food form because we you create a platform where we could support each other through it. I think there is something big, and um, I see it going uh, rapidly. Also, gonna to be happen, inshallah. If uh, I make it the point that Jim asking for. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. Thanks. I think yeah. it's very, I think I like that. Yeah, go ahead, Jenna. Oh, I was just going to summarize, I think, what you said, right? So I took, this is when you see me looking down, I'm taking some notes, actually. <laughs> so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like, yeah, your dream for the action track is really about um, sharing knowledge and sharing experience, right? And it, many different areas, all those centered around food and agriculture, and not forgetting that important, important part of culture and our dreams for humanity and for the next generation, our generation, yes. and supporting each other's potential. So I also heard some of your points, or some of those topical focus areas are nutrition and healthy food and also food access and food education. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So those are all Perfect. amazing things that I think can go definitely into the action track document. Um, yeah. As you were suggesting, but also as you were suggesting, have other ways of communication, of dialogue as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and also, Nicely I captured. hope that after a pandemic, uh, of Corona, I I praying for, we could be uh, really communicated on the land, on the field. You know that would give us a push. <laughs> yes, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, to be in contact with different types of agricultural farming systems, different types yeah, of production, exactly. for sure, exactly. and to be in contact with each other <laughs> in another way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Inshallah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amira. Love your input. You're love welcome, the Jenna. love the energy on that. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Nicely thank captured you. by thank Jenna you. as well. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> yes, great captured by Jenna. Thank you all. Gladly. All right. Okay. So we have other people who want to come in also. Okay, I see Yovana. Mm -hmm. All right, Yovana, hey, you have the floor. Hi everyone. So uh, I don't know if you hear me or see me. You should be. Uh, so yes, there's a bit of an echo. So if it's possible to reduce the echo, I think it's helpful for the interpreters. Um, but otherwise, go ahead. I will do my best. Uh, so I wanted to um, to join uh, the discussion on what we want to see uh, on the way forward. And I think that the compendium is so great. And I think Amira should, should definitely join uh, the team with all her <laughs> benevolence and like the, the, the nice uh, way of presenting and all the blessings she gives to this group. So thank you very much, Amira. And I was wondering like how we could do, oh, hi. <laughs> uh, what we could do in order to, um, to continue this discussion and promote it uh, the way forward uh, by also getting more discussion dons and more platforms, wanting more, having more accountability uh, also of, of this institution for it to be an institution and for not to be just a discussion we're having today. And I was wondering, I know that we have mentioned the compendium and the, the, different, uh, the different action plans, but I was wondering, um, how do we make ourselves heard and how do you think you will, uh, we will be able to keep this platform an institution or something that can go on and have these discussions regularly or at least if not regularly, uh, how we will be able um, 
to, to, to have another date. Is there a World Food... I, I actually think I know the answer, but there will probably be a World Food Forum too. Uh, but how, how does it go to, up to the weight there? Do, do we have another date, another meeting, another meeting point? Um, I am both in the org team and also a little bit outside of the discussions, so I'm pretty sure the audience would like to know as well. So maybe we can open the discussion on this point. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Jenna, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, definitely. I think that's an excellent point to clarify. And it's definitely part of what's laid out in this governance document. So everyone who is interested in saying, how does the World Food Forum continue? How do we work between now and World Food Forum 2022, for example, God willing that it happens. Um, those are really questions for the working group first of the governance document and can definitely imagine that then when a inaugural focal points group can be selected, that's their first item of work, right? Is to say, how do we form the World Food Forum 22 together? How often do we meet in what form? Is it digital? Maybe it could be in presence. All those type of questions are things that the working groups should form together and that um, working groups really co-lead, choose their co-leads from within themselves so they can form that way forward together. Definitely. Great. Um, Great. Jim, yeah. would you have yeah, something to add actually, or to clarify what I said? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, there. so there are ways to approach that question also. So it's more of um, in terms of how do we work um, hand in hand with everybody from different parts of the world? It's more of what tools are we going to be using? Um, and so, for example, just for us to get started with the, the Youth Action Compendium, we, we used a mix of different tools, simple as a Miro board that Lizanne um, put together uh, put she put a lot of effort in that Miro board of it's like it's like a digital canvas of like meta cards for ideas to be put and organized together. There was a a, a platform called Taget that is a kind of a, a cat academic route that would be kind of um a way for us to identify keywords and documents to to utilize it for the youth action compendium. So these are the tools that we've used initially and so those are also some things that if you have anything any suggestion from the floor that we'd love to know if there are tools that could help us streamline um you know the the kind of work that we want to do with the working groups and all of that um and there was also uh, some discussions or some suggestions coming from the floor yesterday jenna if i remember where we had a mentee out and people were putting out um suggestions of using discord um, do we use Slack? Do we use, you know, how do we create that community? And from what I know, there was also a partner organization that offered a platform where they can host like a World Food Forum community. So I think, you know, those are the platforms in which we'd like to explore and, and, and know about that we could use so that this is not going to be a one-off thing. Like, you know, after today, we're just going to wait for another event for us to come together again and discuss, but really how do we build that community around the goals and the aspirations that we put together in the past few you know, months that, that went into these documents. So again, going back to the floor, if you have any suggestions, and these are just, this is just the, you know, the discussion on tools. The other part to look at it is also the ways forward in terms of how do we engage with other stakeholders, right? Like the outcomes of these documents, the, the content of these documents, how do we communicate it with stakeholders? What is the best way to kind of go into stakeholders, policy areas, or with governments, with civil society, with intergovernmental, with private sector partners, with, with farmers and all of these? So what are ways forward in terms of of engaging as well. So 
yeah, I see Yovana's hand up again. Hi, Yovana again. We'd love to know more about your inputs. Go ahead. Please make sure your microphone is clear for our interpreters. Okay, I will try my best. The room is as it is. <laughs> uh, so I am... Um... Hi, again. Uh, so I was wondering also, and I think one of the suggestions I would like to see is to expand, and you, you were just getting there, Jim, I saw that, uh, to expand to the new stakeholders, the other ones. I mean, there are many companies having their use involved. There are many uh, political leaders that involve also their use in, in, different, um, in different places, in different things we didn't we did speak to uh, farmers we did have other stakeholders but i think it will be really interesting when we manage to get this one to go bigger and greater by reaching out to the youth organizations as we did like the ngos the grassroots uh, leaders and the, the people who are also researchers that it would be really great to see for instance um I don't know, the, 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 the young people who are already very invested in their uh, small companies or in their businesses, because those are also communities that have the power to leverage change. We are not the only one as policymakers, but we spoke about regionalizing and localizing our actions. And I believe that those communities, I'm not saying that companies are the only way, but like if we take into account the other stakeholders, make the World Forum known, the suggestions we make known to them, we'll be able to localize this discussion and this debate and turn it into local policies, uh, very spontaneous actions, maybe in the canteen restaurants and have that useful leadership impulse that we want to see. Uh, in the world and in the job markets and in the future agri-food systems, I believe. Absolutely. All those stakeholders are very crucial to engage with. And I see a question in the, in the chat box as well. Um, so from Separatas, uh, there's, a, there's a comment made that Thanks so much. And I think in first moment, maybe is more easy thought of everyone to do the promotion of the program. But at this point, I ask you how I can do the linking with the people of my town with your organization. Um, and so this is basically one of those, uh, you know, scenarios in which we'd love to explore how we can bring it from this global level down to like regional, national, and even local areas. Um, and so I think that's where for us, we'd love to know what are your suggestions also in terms of how to move forward. Like, do you want to create a national fora, for example? This is an example. I'm just putting it on table so that there is kind of like a mirror entity that is in your own country or in your own locality. Um, and and that is something that would be, uh, you know, that that would be kind of a way for us to engage with you at the ground level. So, yeah, definitely. Jenna just asked, would you want to elaborate on that? We'd love to have you speak. Um, please do um, raise your hand if you want to speak. We, we can promote you as panelists and we, we can have you present your intervention or your question in person. Um, at least we can see your face as well. Um, would you be happy to do that? Yeah, if so, raise your hand or respond to us in the chat. And if not, that's also fine. I love Jim's point about um, thinking about if there's um, some type of national level or um, member state level where that can happen. Um, oh, and I see that we should also remind you, you are welcome to speak in your own language as well, because we have the interpretation in the six UN languages. So feel free. And that invitation goes to everyone as well. So, and to briefly respond to um, your intervention, Giovanna, I think that's 
excellent what you're suggesting there to also do explicit invitations because yes, we're trying to spread the word as much as possible, but sometimes a direct invitation reaches people better than a general promotion strategy. And I think I definitely agree personally that that's key and that that's something that definitely the working group should take up as one of their first priorities. Yep. Thanks, Jenna. Absolutely. Um, and I see Amin's um, hand raised here. So Amin, hi, nice to see you again. Hi. And we'd love to hear your intervention. Thank you. Uh, actually, I just thought like maybe I want to step in after seeing uh, the comment uh, from Separatas about how we can link the, with the link, let's say this kind of uh, communications with the people of their own respective local locality, local town or village or organizations to the ones at an upper scale. I, I, I'm, I think that uh, regardless of any network that we are deciding to create for the World Forum or from the young activists, uh, it, it needs to be structured. It needs to be structured, but doesn't need, need mean that it has to be a top-down structure. It can be a circle of structure, but what we necessarily need for sure is focal point. So if Separatas feels that it's necessary for him to deliver messages, to his own, uh, let's say, village or town, bringing from the organization or vice versa to deliver the messages from his own community to us. So he or himself, he or she himself, should be uh, responsible for finding the focal point or volunteering as a focal point that they can, uh, let's say, they can. Uh, in some ways translate but not by just translating i mean by language by translating the message in all kinds of way that they understand to their own community so this communication i mean it, it's not going to be easy if we look at it at a global scale we cannot have everyone in in one platform and speaking and expecting that everyone understands in the same way and same perspective because we are coming from different realities different backgrounds so i think that the role of focal points are very necessary here and uh, in my opinion i would uh, i would definitely invite every uh, young activist that are present here that is uh, inspired to join to of course volunteer at least at the lowest level at the I mean at the lowest scale in their own community to be a focal point and uh, let's see how we can connect these I mean then when we have focal points it's much easier to connect the focal points together and I mean that can start like a focal point from the community level then it goes higher to the city level then it goes to national level then it comes to continental and then international ones so I think this would be a structure that it can work, but yes, it doesn't need to be a top-down approach. It can be circular. So yeah, this is basically my, what I thought I could add. Thank you. Thank you so much, I mean, Maybe Thank I can, you. oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, go I was ahead, going Jenna. to say, maybe I can respond to that briefly, just given my knowledge of the zero draft or the governance document, because a focal points group, not quite how you are describing, is described in this zero draft, right? So it's the guidelines that we put in there are for regional representation, gender representation, um, identity group representation, what have you. Um, and that that's kind of, that's functioning a bit as a steering committee, right? Um, but we named it focal points group because we wanted to represent this um, circular approach that you were describing, right? So that that focal point works together with their constituency to create that circular feedback. So that's what's envisioned in the zero draft, but that's definitely a call for folks here to take a look at that and see if there's more language, more suggestions in there that really makes that a reality because that's, I think, kind of the hope in the zero draft. Um, but there can be a wide gap between hopes and intentions and reality. And so that's why we need the feedback, right? Um, and to work together on it.
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. When when Amin was just talking about that, I I remembered right away into the the, the focal points uh group of the of the governance uh document. And I think um it's it's very crucial that 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 it also the governance document also looks into you know the different um I think specific groups was it um Jenna with the young scientists with with these um policymakers or something something to that effect and so there's that way and and, and this is something that is not cast in stone um we, and I want to reemphasize that that it's not final and cannot be moved and cannot be modified but it's open for everybody's feedback. And so that this is why we're having this conversation now is that the input and feedback coming in from here would basically bring the zero draft to the next level or to the next iteration that is more inclusive of everybody's ideas. So definitely love to see um, more ideas coming in. And yeah, I mean, go ahead. Sorry, I just... Uh remembered what I wanted to say uh, to answer the question, what do I want to see? So based on, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, to be honest, I didn't have the chance or maybe I couldn't find the zero draft to, to have a look about like the structures for the focal points. And I would be uh, thankful if someone could, uh, let's say, if they could fill it in uh, in the chat so I can find the link. But yeah, I was going to ask about uh, if we are going to uh, have focal points, let's say we have a focal point for gender equality in my community. I have a focal point that is going to be, uh, uh, I don't know, responsible for reflecting the problems about value chain. There is going to be one going to be about environmental issues, all of these different ones. How can we ensure that uh, these focal points are not going to fall into the same trap that we are uh, uh, basically having problem now as working in different silos. How are we going to ensure this interaction among the focal points in a very, uh, let's say, lively way that they're all the time aware of what's going on and we can, and, and, yeah, we don't just create division again. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really yeah. important to go into that systems approach, you know. Um, I think it's high time we address that. <laughs> yeah, that was, whether it's achieved or not for the zero draft, that was also part of the hope behind naming it um, focal points focal group points. instead yeah. of having it um, steering committee members nominated from particular youth organizations or particular constituencies. So the way that it's written now is that you're maybe not defining solid categories for each focal point. So for example, there's not a gender focal point for Southeast Asia, for example that's written in the focal points group. It would be really based on the composition of the group. So when one person comes in, they then represent um, a multitude of identities, stakeholders, et cetera. Um, whether that's the best approach is totally open for discussion, right? Um, but that's kind of the suggestion that's made with the focal points group um, and should be discussed further in the working group and with our constituencies how that should look like yeah yeah very very interesting points um, and uh, i mean i just put the links to the uh, documents in the chat box so feel free to go and dive into those um, and we'd love to get your feedback once you've gone through them so again, opening it to the floor, anybody who has you know ideas, any idea basically on how to bring this um, session, this youth action assembly forward so that we're not going to be bound to an event. This is not just an event. This is basically from its name, youth in action um, in food systems, yeah? And so we're going to be working together how do we drive the pro the process? How do we how do we go and navigate through the dynamics of of working with different actors and stakeholders across the food system? So again, 
The floor is open. Feel free to jump in. Raise hand button is there for you guys. The the chat box is open and the Q&A button is, is also there for everybody to come in. So we'd love to see your inputs and your feedback. Uh, go ahead. For those who haven't seen the documents yet or were not able to listen in on yesterday's discussions, the, the links to the documents are in the chat box and you can go through them one by one. You could go to the zero draft that summarizes it. You could go to the different documents um, for more in-depth uh, details of, the, of each part. So yeah. I think, Jenna, one of the things that were, I mean, while waiting for people to come in, right, and also with the discussions that Amin uh, brought in to the table, I think it's also crucial to see how the working groups are kind of like a mix of different sectors, right? So it's not just if it's if it's working on gender, it's not just particularly gender, but it's a blend of like different issues coming together, yeah, with that are related like gender and land tenure perhaps or gender with climate and all these issues being addressed in a more holistic manner instead of just addressing an issue for its own um, you know, particular side of it and bringing solutions that address more cross-cutting, ma making it more cross-cutting. Is that something that we could go into? What do you guys think? Yeah, from my perspective, definitely. And I think this is also something that it was kind of envisioned with the focal points group as well, that there can be different technical expertises that are also brought into the focal points group, depending on who is chosen by the assembly and what um, technical areas also are um, chose to be focused on or are priorities for the group. So I would definitely agree with that. And I see Amira has raised her hand. So I'd love to invite Yeah. To Hi, Amira. Soon. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, answer Amin with uh, a simple question. I know that the World Food Forum answered has answered before, but I wanted to ask it from our in your heart, why we are doing this? Why each one of us doing this? Why we are here right now? Why, why we want to continue in this and put com commitment, high commitment, hours, potentials, lives, uh, uh, effort, energy. Why we wanted to do this? If we could unify our why, I think, or our answer on the why question, I think that we could drive the world food form into the future. And uh, I think that we could afford all the effort that we should do in the future. Uh, that's it. Hello. Yeah, thanks, Amira. Got that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. So, anyone could answer this or talk to me about this? Yeah, and I think why, Amin would like to are... respond to that. <laughs> okay. Why, Amin? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Amira. I think that that is definitely a fundamental question that uh, it, it depends. Yeah, I mean, actually, we all have to have a clear answer about that before. Uh, considering ourselves as an activist or someone that wants to contribute to fixing a global issue, because if you don't know this answer to you, your own heart, that what is your individual commitment, then how are you going to be able to spread this as in form of a word or a message or an action uh, in, your, in your surrounding environment? You really need to be uh, sure that you, first of all, are committed regardless of any other external judgment, just your own internal belief and action that you are committed to what you are, uh, what are your values, what are your beliefs, and then start, uh, I think, yet yeah, sharing this idea, sharing this vision 
with others in your community or the organization that you want to uh, contribute to. And there was something uh, that was, I mean, that is relevant to this. I just had a very quick skim through the documents that Jim shared. Thank you so much for them. And uh, one thing that I was uh, trying to find was uh, to have a clear line uh, in the, I don't know which document was it. Was it the action plan document or the uh, compendium? So basically what I was looking for was to see a clear line that connects the youth with the older generation. Unfortunately, currently this uh, connection is very binary. You're either an adult or old experience or you are unexperienced and you're young and you're young, you could be a child, you can be a teenager, you could be, I don't know, below 30s, you're all in one group. And then after that, you're an adult, you're experienced and you're totally separated. So I think we really miss this intergenerational connection and exchange. And uh, I believe uh, we can solve many issues that are related to understanding between different generations by creating scenarios, by creating some actions that we can involve both. Well, I'm also now saying that as well, like doing the same mistake by involving both generations. What I mean by the old, whoever considers themselves as old adult experience and whoever uh, uh, considers themselves as young and adult. So I think this issue of identity that is a human-made issue again, we created this ourselves. I think this has to be fixed by, or has to be a little bit more clear by, by uh, putting people into action to realize that these are, just some, uh, these are just some virtual borders. They don't really exist. And the same way a 70-year-old farmer can enjoy harvesting and cooking like uh, the, the, the products that they have, could, could, could be the same feeling and the same joy for a 10 year old child that wants to do that. But the only way you can feel that is to create a scenario, create a, a something that you can get them engaged together. So, so many, I mean, the, there are many activities that are happening around the world in local communities, uh, for, for instance, uh, for uh, let's say like cooking festivals and such the kind of things that brings these generations together. But I think uh, this is something that in, in one of these documents as youth, we need to uh, maybe emphasize because I think uh, again, based on what Amira said, we need to take this a little bit at a deeper level and to understand that we, we, we need to also, let's say, heal this connection that we have with the past generations. Maybe in many, in many uh, it, depending on the culture, depending on where we are talking about different realities, there should be a stronger bond between different generations. There shouldn't be a separation. And uh, I think this, uh, on my personal view, this does exist. And this separation causes, mis is a main cause of, I mean, not main cause, I mean, it's interrelated with the same way that uh, there is a mistrust between different generations, for example. And not having this trust will also not end up to any kind of uh, collaboration, will not end up to any kind of action that we want to do with different generations. So. Yeah, this is, I think, something that we can focus on, either in terms of action or communication. Thank you. Thank you, I mean, I'm sorry, the mic is on. Thank you, I mean, so much. And just wanted to add that the World Food Forum is a chance to, to break this separation and end it. Exactly, exactly. And before I hand the floor over to... Uh, Lawrence, who's raised his hand, um, let me just jump in quickly on that note uh, on, on intergenerational um, processes. And I think that's very crucial for us to look into, especially because um, the evidence points a lot to that divide that you were saying. I mean, that, you know, there, it, the way we've approached youth 
in farming and agriculture has been very binary. And so, uh, so I, I'd, I'd love to see, uh, you know, how we can, how we can break those barriers and how the World Food Forum can be the advocate to put, to break down those barriers and to create the bridges between, between these generations and, and establish that highway, I would say, highway of knowledge. Yeah. So now I think, um, the next, uh, person I know Lawrence has her hand up. Um, so Lawrence, yeah, you have an intervention. We'd love to hear it. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it was just to add on what Amin said and, and also what Giovanna uh, wrote in the chat because I found it very interesting. Uh, I also totally agree with um, what Amin said about the fact that we need to reconsider what youth mean maybe in relation also to other groups and what are our tasks and our how, how do we define youth and how... Uh, yeah, you, we want to, to have a um, relation with other uh, stakeholders uh, and why do we, do we name ourselves this way? And um, also I had the impression the, from yesterday and today there's like a different set of tasks that the World Food Forum has, for example, um, support youth groups in their context uh, to act, but also to have a sit at the table at the table and to, to be able to to influence uh, decision making and this is very much context specific so it will need to to be in a way like the, the groups um the youth groups can decide like can ask to the world Food forum specific things that they need in their context um at the same time i have the impression we talked a lot about reaching out to other groups and uh, to specific um, science, for example, behavior science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So maybe there can be a working groups trying to reach out to all relevant stakeholders. They could then be linked to the to to youth groups that need some information or that need some um, evidence based, uh, yeah, things uh, to act. And then um, we talked a lot about also knowledge and 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 how we can create knowledge uh, with the experience of each youth group and, and how the, the, they are acting and how they can um, best uh, move their own context. And then this would be then the, what Amin said yesterday, for example, the, the, the tasks, uh, uh, the, the skills mapping of everyone um, um, that is part of the World Food Forum that could be very useful in this, in this endeavor. Yeah. This was what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very I love the points and I love the energy that's brewing up. Um, Jenna, do you have anything to say? Or I, I know you kind of motioned something, so go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment about this discussion about the intergenerational divide and also about some of um, maybe on Lawrence's points that you just brought up real quick. And then, of course, um, we will give you the floor, um, the next person who has raised your hand. Um, but yeah, so yeah, in the governance document, that's a little bit how we had envisioned this um, open ended partners working group. So basically, anyone who wants to be involved with this group, this is that yeah, a mechanism for that involvement. Now that said, yeah, definitely it's a little bit of drawing lines. So it's like a, a attempt to structure things and show that clear way for folks to come in and to make this intergenerational bridge. And that was the hope and the intent through the working group. And I think there's definitely some great work that we can do together then to refine that or or scrap it all and form it in a different way, right? This is just a zero draft and it's just to create some type of suggestion, right? So hopefully that can be done together with the governance document. And I will say that this definition of what is youth, that is like the unending challenge, right? Because society loves a age cutoff. Um, and Jim is nodding. He contributed to the HPLE report, and it definitely says there that a conceptual definition of youth is the most productive, right? Which is pretty much, I think, a summary of what you we were talking about here is when are you not 
you a young farmer? What do all these things mean, right? Um, and so that's definitely, I think, will be a heated discussion going forward. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if we jump into that question, that's going to take a really long discussion on just how to define youth and all that. But, um, you know, going forward, really looking at the structure, how we can move forward with the World Food Forum and the Youth Action Assembly is what we're hoping to, from all these ideas coming up. And I love how we're, everybody's coming in right now. Uh, I think everybody's just warming up at the earlier stage of the session. And now it's like a popcorn of ideas coming out. And so next I see Falguni has his, ra his hand raised. So Falguni, come in and take out the floor. We'd love to hear your intervention. Pranam, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and privilege for me to speak before this August audience. We have a choice. We can continue to grow our food system in a linear, exploitative, and extractive way, or we can move to a system that promotes biodiversity, regeneration, nutrition, food, equity, and healthy people. We believe the decision is clear. We must choose to work the planet, not against it, for the benefit of the May by following these principles. Harness the re regenerative power of our earth, build stronger local and circular food systems, give farmers a voice and support their planet positive choice, move from low cost to true cost, foster radical collaboration. As you know, demand for food will continue to increase and will do so in the context of increasing scarcity of natural resources and important changes in structural composition of the demand for food and agriculture products. Climate change and increased competition for natural resources will continue to contribute to natural resources de degradation and scarcity with negative impacts on people, livelihood, and food security. Problems of extreme poverty, hunger, food insecurity, and undernourishment will persist, along with increase in overweight, obesity, diet-related chronic diseases, natural disasters are increasing number of instantly, and along with climate change related extreme weather events are expected to depend on the global need for humid assistance and resilience building for farmers and rural households. At the same time, transboundary plant pests and disease and other emerging threats continue to provoke crisis in agriculture and food system and impact productivity and human health. Conflicts are continuing and food instancy in many parts of the world with, with spare economic and social consequences beyond the affected countries. And I uh, suggest everyone we should follow SDG 2.4.1 indicator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and make sure to sign up on the Google form so we could continue to streamline your ideas, your suggestions into the documents, into the working groups, and how we're going to move forward. Thank you very much for that intervention, intervention Falguni. We totally appreciate it. Now, I see Tommaso's hand raised. And so, Tommaso, you have an intervention. Um, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for being here. I also see that um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, uh, Mr. Hugoven is online. So uh, I'll be very quick. So I'll leave, I can leave the floor um, for the um, question and answer session. So, um, you know, uh, trying to summarize what has been said and, uh, you know, trying also to think in a more uh, practical way, you know, we have understood that um, we have uh, multiple layers of um, complexity here, right? So we have the differentiation of the, of the context we are, uh, we are talking about when we think of um, agri-food systems, uh, but also we have the complexity which is related to uh, the complexity of the agri-food system itself, which is a very um, 
complex matter which um, you know intertwines with a, a lot of other aspects. But uh, you know, I think we uh, as youth here we have uh, an advantage. We can establish um, a unique language. We can establish uh, a stable mechanism and a stable platform. And another advantage is the fact that um, our way of thinking is uh, profoundly action oriented, right? So we have to make sure that uh, we transmit this uh, action oriented thinking, way of thinking to the mechanism and the platform that we are trying to, to establish. And we try to think in a very practical way because this is a, an opportunity that we've been given to really, uh, you know, make our voice heard and, uh, and make our, uh, our statements here. So uh, we, really need, we really need to make sure that we do not waste this opportunity and that we really establish something really effective uh, and that we can really contribute effectively to the, to the agri-food system transformation. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommaso, for that intervention. And definitely love to see that, that this all this would really drive towards action on the ground. It's not just going to be something that's something up there, but really looking at how we can build communities with young people um, to, to drive action. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge His Excellency Ambassador Hans Hugevin, who's just come in and joined us. Hello, Ambassador Hans. It's, it's always a pleasure to see you and uh, have you in these conversations. I think um, we've, we've, we've had a lot of contributions already on the floor and, and we're still open to con con um, contributions from the floor. You can go to the Google form, make sure to sign up and, and join that uh, link and be part of the working group, be part of the action on the ground and help us drive forward. And so with that, you know, I think um, I, I would say this is a, a pause for now on the contributions from the floor. And now we're going to move into a different segment of this session also, which is a conversation with His Excellency and also the FAO independent chair, uh, the independent chair of the FAO council. If I got that right, Ambassador Hans. Um, and uh, so again, go ahead, make sure to sign up on the link. For now, we're going to transition over with Ambassador Hans and Jenna as well in this conversation. So good day, Ambassador Hans. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And it is, an, of course, an honor and a pleasure uh, to be with you. And I must say, you have done a fantastic job. Really, I'm impressed what I've seen the last couple of days. I couldn't be uh, at all the sessions, but... I'm impressed. It's fantastic. And the World Food Forum is indeed the first, I would say, of its kind global forum for the youth, where the young people come together, where young people support, I would say, the transformation of, to a more sustainable and better food system at all levels and coming with great innovative ideas. And besides the fact that it is a moment of celebration of all the work being done and the importance of the youth, I think the, the medium itself was very innovative because what we have seen is technology competition. Uh, we have seen music, festivals, film, culinary uh, arts, supporting videos. It was amazing. And it shows that where sometimes we have quite dull meetings within the UN system, you have spiced up, I would say, our lives and our meetings in the UN system. But moreover, I think what's so important is that there are a few things which in life which can bring people together. And we have seen that food is one of the most powerful issues and themes which can be people all over the world bring together to see what we need to be done to make sure that we get to a better life and a better world and a more healthy diet and a more healthy pl planet. And what you have shown is the power of the youth and the necessity that looking to the future 
of I would say organizations like FEO, but I would say not only the Rome based agency, but also UN organizations that we need to involve the youth much more in our processes, listening to their new and innovative ideas and give them a voice also in the formal meetings. And that's what I certainly, as in my new role as independent chair, certainly will do when it comes to counts and other meetings. But I will say something more when I listen to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hans, for the support and for the initiative and for the leadership that you're bringing in, especially in championing the youth, uh, the cause of youth for uh, in agriculture and food systems. And I've seen that in the past three years that I've known you and I'm very happy to see how we're moving forward together with the different agencies coming together and different stakeholders really um, coming from young people at the back seat and now giving them the, the capacity to really drive the, the direction of, of development in the way that they see it. Well, to kick off uh, the, the, this conversation with Ambassador Hans, um, I know that uh, there you have that the, the leadership in, and you have the youth in your heart in, in the policies that you push for. And so in line with that, as the independent chair of the FAO Council, how can we ensure that the World Food Forum youth mechanism is recognized and given access to working closely with, with FAO and the, even the Rome-based agencies for policies and or projects or or anything else for that matter. So Ambassador Hans, how, how do we do that? I think with the um, World Food Forum, which is not a one time, I would say forum, because you're hopefully going to continue for many years, you created a powerful body, an informal, a great international network of the youth. And of course it is new and we have to get adjusted to it. I think what we have to do is now the next to take the next step. As I said, when I was uh, firm rep, I organized that the, the youth could have a voice uh, in the uh, council. But I think with the World Food Forum, I saw already a draft compendium of your advices. I think it should be taken up. So it's not only the council. I will come to the council, but I will discuss with uh, the chairs of, uh, for example, the Pong Committee, Finance Committee, CCLM, but also other chairs uh, to see how we can make use of already your questions and remarks to embed it in our thinking, in our work, and also to reply to you, not to say, okay, we've looked to your compendium, we were nice ideas, but also give answers to things which are there. I think that's important. And that gives then also the, the, the World Food Forum a position in our governance system. Secondly, what I certainly will do myself is to give you a voice in the council uh, and, and perhaps uh, it could be uh, the, let's have flexibility in that it could be one statement it could be statement when you address a certain issues but it's important that we give the world food forum uh, a, a, a voice in the council that we listen to our youth and i've heard so many colleagues here in rome but also outside of rome so even in new york it's so great to listen to the youth and sometimes you only have to have special, we only hear it in special occasions. I think we have to make every occasion a little bit special so that we listen to you, to your new, new ideas or, or your innovations, or even your complaints uh, or cynical remarks, what to do better in every council. But I will, I would say, invite also the chairs of the other committees to do the same, to give you a voice uh, but it gives also, it's not a formal right. Let's not discuss that because it's not necessary. It's also an obligation for you then to come forward, not only this week, but also uh, on those occasions with an input to the discussions. But I'm very confident that you will do it. Uh, and it will be the light. And let's have that discussion. Let's open up a little bit. That is very promising and that's very positive. Uh feedback and, and, and the way forward. Thank you, Ambassador Hans. Um, Jenna, do you have any questions for Ambassador Hans? I would 
love to follow up on your comments there and really this big invitation and huge olive branch to the young people. And you were saying this is also an obligation to youth to come up basically how I interpret it with substantive policy positions for these statements and to talk with the FAO Council. And I was wondering your perspective, what is one of the biggest added values that youth as a unique and new constituency can bring to the FAO Council and the RBAs? I think what you've shown this week is already what you can bring in because what I've seen are new elements, uh, new ideas, which perhaps I, even I didn't think about. And the most important thing is when you look to the countries worldwide and the different regions, you see, uh, especially for example, in Africa, a huge unemployment. And we have to see what can we do more to support those countries in finding youth employment. What we have to do is how can we scale up good initiatives of the youth? And the problem sometimes when we are sitting here in Rome is that we don't know, I would say, excellent initiatives. I think there the World Food Forum could play a role. I have all, I've said it, and I will say it also in the council. I think it's important that we not only look to our policy making and our policies, but that we also discuss how it's being implemented to showcase good implementation and where there are stumbling blocks. And in that respect is also, and I think there the World Food Forum, I would say the Youth World Food Forum, can play a crucial role is collecting, I would say, great initiatives, which can be scaled up. Because if we know it, I, I, I see the UN also as a networking uh, organization. If we know it, we can use our network and not only with governments, but also with civil society or the private sector to see the, whether or not we can scale up those good initiatives for the support they need. It's not a promise, but I think knowing is always helping to get further. And that's, we used, we have to use our networks. And you have strong networks, we have strong networks. If you combine them, I've seen many initiatives which started small, but using or getting connected with the right people blew them up and scaled them up. So I think that's what the World Forum, the, the, the Youth World Food Forum can do, helping those initiatives to be scaled up and to bring the right people there if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hans. That's really, um, I, I, lo I love that uh, direction in, in how we bring that together, working together closely. And, I, and I'd like to take this opportunity because this was a point that was discussed really just a while ago with other fellow young people in this session about talking about creating that intergenerational bridge, right? With young people working closely with people who have more experience than young people in, in this space. And, um, and to that note, I would like to ask this question of um, during all of your years within the FAO or the UN system, what has been the most important lesson learned which young people can keep in mind as we progress with the World Food Forum and the Youth Action Assembly? For me, I would say the most important lesson, and I'm still learning that lesson, by the way, uh, although I'm quite old, <laughs> is believe in yourself. I think that's the most important lesson I've learned. There are many setbacks in your life and even working with the UN. I always say, I, sometimes I'm giving lectures to also classes. I say the UN is always two steps forward and one step backwards. But I think you, the strength of the UN is the only forum where on an equal basis, one country, one vote, we discuss the most important issues together. And of course, we are not always finding the right solutions, but think about a world without the UN. Then we are lost because it will be then the survival of the fittest or the richest. We have more conflicts. We don't discuss issues like food security or climate change, and that's the strength of the UN, but at the same time, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your inspiration, you can inspire others. And sometimes in difficult situations in negotiations where you think you have achieved, uh, it was in 2007, 
when we had the uh, UN form, form of force where we had an instrument, instrument, we were almost there. And then one country said, I cannot support it. Then you're devastated. I was devastated because I was chairing that meeting. But I thought, come on, don't show your disappointment. Go for it. Take that last step. Try to inspire that country as well. Show that you have support. And always think, and that's the second lesson I always learned, think in solutions instead of problems. What I've learned over the last couple of years with believing in yourself, with inspiration, for every problem, a solution can be found. And sometimes, and certainly with your inspiration and what you have shown the last couple of days, we have to step out of the box, about our uh, uh, out of the box thinking, or perhaps do unusual things. But with creativity, solutions can always be found. I've never found a problem for which we could not find a solution. Perhaps that is not solved the whole problem, but we can make a step forward. I think with that and using your network, you think about your network, you have so much power in yourself to be an inspiration for the people around you and get things done. I love that. Believe in yourself. That's a that's a powerful um, lesson that I think many of us can take forward and bring in to the work that we're going to be we're going to be doing together. Um, Jenna, do you have anything um, on your mind? I see you nodding and all that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely love this statement. Think in solutions instead of problems as well, because I think that can really drive action forward. And I would really be curious. Um, if you could perhaps describe a moment in your career that still inspires you, which you would like to impart to youth, and maybe it's one of these solutions instead of problems. Yeah, there, there, I mentioned already, uh, but that was an, an international agreement on uh, sustainable forest management. But one of the things I think when I was, I think it was 2014, 2015, so many data and information came about food losses. And I was then working in the, in the Netherlands and said, we have to do something about the food losses. So, and I was inspired, we have to bring people together. So we organized, I organized together with uh, World Bank and FEO, an international conference, which is always nice, but we said, we cannot leave it here. There were many nice things. And then with one other person, we started, a group of people around uh, how to tackle food losses globally, but certainly on a national uh, level. Uh, and it was a it's called now the Champions 12.3, and there are more initiatives now around food losses. But I think doing that and seeing, because it was not, I didn't have it in my mind, all those things, but just starting, being positive, trying to get some people around the idea and now we are five, six years further, and it's one of the priority issues where we're now starting in, in, in Nigeria with a pilot. I think that's how it can be done. And that's starting thinking, perhaps sometimes making thinking big, but start something and see where it gets. Sometimes you won't get it. Nine of the 10, from the 10, perhaps it won't happen. But at once, where it succeeds, you get things done. And I think that's why you have to, that's why I'm always trying to have new initiatives, thinking in solutions, thinking in how can we tackle the problem? And, was, and, then, and then you can inspire people. Love it. Start somewhere and see, and you know, sometimes it's one out of 10 uh, ideas that will get there, but I think it's the perseverance and the patience in that. And now, I want to take a different spin on this, uh, Your Excellency. If if you would uh, oblige, uh, this is this is always the context. Us young people asking you the questions, um, and I we want to take a different spin to this. Like you said, take thinking out of the box. We'll put a different twist to it somehow. Where maybe you have some questions for us, young people, and we'd love to know what you want to know from us or what you want to posit to us as a question. So, Ambassador, please do go ahead. Yeah, please call me Hans, because with all those ambassadors, excellencies, we create so much distance. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and it's not needed, because I think all right. the more we just meet each other and see each other as 
young and, and older people with a name uh, brings people much more together. But my question, of course, is you have had an amazing success the last couple of days. What will be your two, I'd say two lessons learned, main lessons learned, and what will be your two demands, and not requests, but demands, I would say, to uh, uh, the, the Council uh, of FEO happening? Jenna, do you want to take one each of those? <laughs> Definitely. I would love to. Thank you for giving me the chance to respond, of course. I Go think ahead. that one of the main um, lessons learned is that there is, of course, a lot of power with youth and there's a lot of interest. And so there is the potential for this to move forward and that this is going to be something that can sustain itself from the energy. And so that couples my lesson learned to a demand, which is something that has been discussed over the past day and a half, is that young people often lack resources. And so this World Food Forum, of course, needs the ongoing, especially financial, intellectual support of the Rome-based agencies. Great. And I'm going to come in on that after and then let Hans um, respond to it. And uh, for me, I think the lesson learned really is that this is um, basically the past uh, five days of the World Food Forum has been just really a tip of the iceberg of what young people can bring into the food systems. And I really hope that that's something that the, the agencies, the stakeholders, the member states have seen and see the value that young, young people bring in. Um, the creativity and innovation that young people have is just right there. And it's just waiting to be tapped and discovered and unlocked. And I think that's something that the food systems really need. Um, the, uh, the demand, I think, on, on, the, on my end would be really to look at how, um, you know, aside from, of course, the budgets that would necessarily um, enable the, the sustainability of these kinds of platforms, so that young people can be engaged without having to, you know, there, there's always this, this struggle between with, with young people having to have that, that day job just so that they can get by on a daily basis, as well as doing the advocacy work that they love because they have a passion for food systems and issues around food systems that they feel and they see in their communities. And so the, 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 the demand really would be more, how do we enable that these structures are cascaded down um, and that the, the Rome-based agencies can create that policy environment that allows member states to provide these spaces for their young people at the country level and that they are empowered at that level so that they can be heard and that those voices can be brought to the global level where also most of the policies are created. So it's really on that note. And I see our colleague from India, Falguni, also has an intervention. And Falguni, you have the opportunity to present what you have in your mind and intervention to um, Hans as well. Go ahead, Falguni. Thank you, Chair, and Namaste. Namaste, Hans. Actually, we have to work like the whole world is one family. We have to work like one family, not like uh, jealousy, not like ego. And we have to work from local level to globalization. We have to focus from local to vocal as a globalization. And as a young, we are the powerhouse of nation. And as you know, Hans and many other directors and delegates, they already done. They, they are our senior. We have to inspire from them and we have to do something. Actually, as you know, we are in midway of SDG 2030 achievable. We are in 2021. We have nine years to achieve 2030 agenda. In, in 2030, if we will not achieve, then it will be a shock for us. Those things our senior and our elder done. If we will not achieve 2030 agenda in 2030, we have to wait 2063. So we have to be work together and we have to be focused on 
local level and another thing we have to believe in trust deficit and green finance and we have to be promised that we have to focus our local sdg if we will easily achieve local sdg then easily whole world will achieve sdg and another thing we have to be cooperate as a friend in need a friend in deal and another thing we have to be create development cooperation bilateral development cooperation and gender and equality and self realization and traditional donor and we have to be a like a friend in need a friend in deed thank you thank you thank you falguni lots of concepts there that young people want to see uh working as a family and again thank you again falguni for that intervention hans over to you to respond to to what we've just said yeah i think always you get the question of uh funding on the table uh, not nothing uh will happen uh, on its mostly nothing will happen on its own but i think with what you have done the fantastic job you have done and the amazing job you have done with the first world food forum i think you have created something which cannot be denied anymore so you created a position for yourself but i think that's what you can expect from from uh fo management but also from for me as independent chair that we bring you to the governing bodies but also important i think when it comes to funding uh to come forward with two or three concrete initiatives which need to be funded at country level not at global level because at global level we can think be creative but at the end and i i agree what was said by Pergini at the end of the day it has to be done at the national or local level but if you can develop two or three concrete ideas where you say okay this can be done but we need this kind of funding and don't come directly with millions uh i think with the network we have with the network we have also with the world business council of sustainable development with some member with the ngos we should show you that we are listening to you to help you finding the funding for those three two or three proposals because i think that's a mechanism which we have to start to working on that's how i worked in my past without having much funding but created with an idea and see if it's a good idea it will get funding i'm working now with an amazing uh, young woman about a, a cookbook uh, with zero or most uh, less carbon it will be launched later uh, this month or she started with an idea and now she has fun she got funding because of the idea and i think i've worked also with Kiran Sethi from from india from your country uh, she started at the riverside school and a movement for young children to show the idea yes we can and two years ago she had an a youth summit for children around between 10 and 13 years 2500 children from 40 countries were here in rome showing their idea showing their movement yes we can it started from scratch see where she got with the funding i think that are that leadership and it shows where you can get with good ideas and then of course you can rely and you should rely and you should question and criticize us if we on the other side won't do our job because that is what you can ask and for example a mechanism what is being now often done in new york is that delegations coming to the official bodies for example it would it be the general assembly or may meeting will have a us representative in their delegation it's an easy thing but if we start now doing that you have every time the possibility to um, to increase your network and get also in within the delegations the voice of the youth when it comes to presenting positions of the of of government so i think that are mechanisms which which we have to work on but you have to i say count on us we count on you because you have to deliver as well and i think that's important come with those ideas and you will get that positive spiral to hopefully much more success in the future Thank you. And I think that's a low hanging fruit for the World Food Forum and the Youth Action Assembly. Um coming up with two or three ideas, we've already mapped out a youth action compendium, we've already mapped out a, a road map for a youth action plan. 
And I think definitely there will be two or three ideas from there that we can definitely develop and evolve and bring forward to you and also the rest of the uh, agencies who'd be willing to help us out. And to close with this, um, uh, sorry, I always get used to the ambassador part. Um, um, Hans, you know, this is just, a, you know, with, with the SDGs um, right there, uh, it's already around the corner really to say that uh, the SDGs are there already. Um, the, the, the question now for us young people is, of course, one is how do we explicitly become part of that uh, uh, agenda? And the, the, la the second one is to um, how do we, how, how, what at least can you impart to young people that, that inspired you through all these years that young people can bring with them to stay inspired in the, in the cause for the sustainable development goals? Yeah, I, 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 th I think I already said it. I think if you believe in yourself and you're believing in yourself, otherwise you wouldn't have created this World Food Forum. So now take the next step. This is an, an amazing and great success. So we take the next step, if you have a success story, to take the next step and make it concrete. Not only to have a voice here in Rome, but make sure that you can support younger people at country level to find support at the country level. And, uh, and I, I know uh, Maximo um, did a great job within FEO uh, by supporting you. Uh, and he uh, broke down silos when the, within the organization to make this, this happen. But Maximo knows, and, and, and perhaps Jin also know, the great a positive thing of the outcome of the World Food System Summit is that for the first time, I think for decades, we have the food systems at the highest political level within the UN, with the heads of states. We have to maintain it. For the first time, we have a lot of energy with many stakeholders around how to transform our food systems, not only here in Rome, but worldwide. We have to maintain it and grab that energy. And my dream was uh, for this first World Food Forum to have a march of the, the youth worldwide for food security, because we had the march for climate change. But no, and I've been also in refugee camps and every and you see the, the terrible things happening every year, every day we are confronted with it. But if the youth can show, I was hoping for a marth in all the city, cities worldwide for food security, shown by the youth, empowered by the youth. And I was hoping for a huge concert here at uh, Circus Maximo, Maximus, uh, uh, here at FVO. But hopefully one time, when we have so hopefully solved the uh, COVID crisis, we can have that, uh, certainly that, that concert, that concert for food security. And why it's so important? Because with food and music, you will change people inside. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a that's a what we could say a concerted effort for a concert. <laughs> Just a pun right there to break uh, the 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 silence as well. And and thank you very much, uh, Hans, for those inputs. I'm going to give a very quick um, opportunity to to I think uh, to to Amira to just give that quick question you have. I really hope you could make it quick in 30 seconds. Um, we're going beyond time. Please make sure to keep within time. Thank you. Uh, I Thank you, Jim. Uh, Hans, first I want to thank you for inspiring us today. And uh, I just have a little demon uh, to keep uh, doing what we are doing uh, in supporting us and accepting us and accepting our mistakes and the times that we need to learn and to keep in our path because it's uh, make us feel secure and uh, keep inspiring us uh, to find our right path. That's we need so much from you um, to do for us. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Amira. But let's turn it around. You know, you have 
the biggest fan and supporter for what you are doing. But it's also, we need you. We need you to find better solutions than what we have done. I still believe we are on the right track, but we have not done enough. We have to do more. And for that, we absolutely need you. We cannot do without you anymore. And that's also a strong request to all those who are listening in. It has to be a joint effort, but at the end of the day, it's the use who or which has the future. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. I promise you we will be there. <laughs> Thank you. A round of applause for Hans, who's uh, who has been a champion for youth for the longest time that I can remember. Again, thank you very much for gracing us and also entertaining us and also being very game with flipping the positions of you asking us the questions. Thank you very much. And we look forward to working closely with you in the FAO Council and as well as uh, in, the, in the work ahead. Again, thank you very much for being with us. You can count on me. Yes, love that. <laughs> thank you, Hans. Okay, that brings this session to a close. That was a good way to close, Jenna. <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, I agree. Yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And so I think with that, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to actually go into a very, uh, uh, we're going to have a, how do you call this? The food priorities, just so that before we close uh, this session, there was a part on food priorities. And let me just bring that up quickly. And I see also we have a hand raised from Tommaso. So oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Tommaso. Let Tommaso make an intervention. I'll leave the floor to Matteo this time. <laughs> oh, Matteo, go ahead. Hey, so um, amazing, amazing session. Thank you, Hans. Um, it's great to hear that we have the back or that the young people have your back. Um, and also, I am very, very sure that some of the elements that you mentioned and some of the concrete action will certainly come out of these uh, two days of assembly. So just stay tuned. I am sure that in the closing, in the closing outcomes of this assembly, um, we will be able to, to produce some of inspiring and, uh, uh, and forward-looking actions and, and, and concrete suggestions, as you mentioned. Um, I just have two, uh, two suggestions. First of all, um, I'm afraid that the volunteer wall has not yet been finalized. We're still waiting for some video and some editing, so we can, <clears throat> we can reduce that section, uh, but we will certainly show it during the closing ceremony. Um, and then maybe we can use the remaining part of this, uh, you know, besides what Jim was, was trying to, to bring forward, also to maybe follow up very much with what Hans was saying. Maybe let's, um, let's uh, at the end of this session, really bring it up to some two, three concrete ideas that we can, we can bring forward, right? Um, I think that we have a lot of elements that we have captured during the past days. Um, we have also the opportunity to report it during the, the outcome, and, uh, sorry, during the closing ceremony. So maybe we can use the time that we have saved uh, uh, not having the photo wall, maybe to discuss these two, three concrete action uh, that we can bring forward. Back to you, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, Matteo. Uh, before we jump into that, and this is basically what I was talking about, um, and, and so that we continue engagement also. And of course, this will go into also the kind of work that, that we have uh, prepared for you know, the working groups and the action compendium. And it's really about, we want to know what you think are your food priorities, what you think should be prioritized. It could be challenges, it could be solutions, it could be issues, anything around foods that you think should be prioritized. Um, so we, we encourage you to go take a picture or use a picture that you visualizes that, post it on social media and use the hashtag uh, food priority and hashtag food for future. So go ahead and do that as well. And, and just uh, show us and tell us also what you think should be prioritized around food. All right, with that, I think um, we can go. Oh, we've done that. And Mateo, how do you how do you propose Jenna? How do we do you want to jump into that? 
Definitely. I mean, I would like to just read a quick would you like list of thank yous uh, for the youth volunteers. I know our photo wall will be at the closing ceremony now. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge all of the hard, hard work that went into the preparation of this World Food Forum here, especially at the Youth Action Assembly, because we have a lot of dedicated participants here who have tuned in over many hours. For a lot of folks, it's been at bizarre times of the day that we don't normally sit in front of the computer just to make this virtual event and gathering happen, right? And so that's like a huge sacrifice that everyone has put forward from their personal time. The majority of this, or a lot of this has been volunteer hours that have gone into this. Um, and so it's a huge thank you. And it's a huge thank you to those volunteers, to the participants, to the FAO staff who has been working tirelessly, staying up late, waking up very early, I know. It's a huge thank you. I see Kazuki just posted in the chat. Thank you all. Kazuki has been working tirelessly and also with the GERT FAO teammates, right? So Mateo, Maria Teresa, Tommaso, Tomas, Emma, um, Giovanna, this, and also Maxi Monterero. Thank you so much for the support that we've gotten through the World Food Forum. We've also had great volunteers here. So you see Jim, he's been dedicated, tuning in all the time. We've been having Friday meetings to help prepare this. Ugratna, you saw yesterday, has done a lot of the brain work behind this governance document. We also had Lisanne, she has been so dedicated, really being a leader in this group, um, just out of her own goodwill and her dedication to this. Um, Lana, she helped co-lead the action track document. Um, we also had Pramisha, who you saw yesterday, co-moderating a session. She's also been fantastic for a major group of mature children and youth. And then I hope I'm not forgetting anyone on my list here. We've also had Lawrence who was um, co-moderating a session and we've also had fantastic presentations, for example, from Amin who was also participating dedicatedly and thank you to the participants, right? So Amira, Panguli, um, Amin, and also our lovely interpreters. Thank you so, so much. And that's all for my thank you list. I know that I definitely forgot someone um, and it's not because I don't value your contributions. It's because I um, quickly put together this list because the photo wall is moved to the evening session. <laughs> yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you for going through that list, Jenna. And I really uh, appreciate you as well. Thank you very much, Jenna, also for the time that you've put in along with everybody else. Um, this has been something that we've done in the past two months and it's just like meetings after meetings and um, and sometimes it's been you know at very um, uh, times of the day that you don't normally have a meeting but yeah it's it's just really to see this go through and, and pull through and we're really happy to see it come to fruition and we're hoping to see and we're very excited to see how it's going to move forward um, and with that, um, I, I see Amin has his hand up. A uh, quick shout out there or an intervention. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, Jim. I thought that uh, I could uh, maybe, uh, because I just saw Mateo's intervention that was asking that we can fill the time or like talk. So I just was thinking like, is it a short time that we have or no? Because I just wanted to comment uh, on uh, what some, some of the things that Hans mentioned. So do we have time for that or no? I would say, I mean, I would say we have about like up to half past. So there is probably like 17 minutes, I think, um, just for the very reason that I'm going to be moderating another session right after this. Mm -hmm. So I need a quick break between these two. Sure. So go ahead. No, no, and I think I just want to say something minutes, very short. Yeah. Thank you. And, and first of all, I think it's very important that we have this appreciation of all of us to once again, uh, I mean, to, to, to have this feeling of, of togetherness and, and thanking, which maybe th does not uh, exist in, in many other environments and always to have this uh, vibe with us. This is, this is a true youth action that we're actually doing now to appreciating each other and, and, and recognizing what we are doing and being grateful for where we are. And uh, relevant to that, about what Hans was, uh, let's say, uh, 
about the comments about Hans and, and what he was saying about the youth. I think uh, when, when we give, uh, let's say, some inspirational talks to the youth that come on, go, believe in yourself, this will be maybe for uh, a bunch of youth that the majority of them are not confident enough in what they're doing. But I think us as the team that we are working here now, the World Food Forum or participating, we are confident enough. We know we're doing an awesome job. And I think this is a kind of a reminder for, uh, let's say, older age-wise generation that we, we the reason that we are having an event that is called the World Food Forum and it's being uh, presented or powered by the global youth is that because this youth is out of the scene in, in, in high levels and has been not there. So we are really looking forward to a future that we will be recognized and this includes this will be included uh, in, 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 all of the, uh, in all of the scenes that we don't need to bring the youth like very bold out there. So we are already working in the process. And uh, yeah, this was basically one thing that I wanted to say. And uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a, another thing that uh, just came to mind, but I think I'll leave that for later. And uh, yeah, I'll just uh, leave the floor. I think Tommaso is also raising his hand to another yeah. intervention. Well, thank you. Thank you. And definitely, yeah, uh, we, I think we, certainly agree on that same note that young people are here we've already presented ourselves we've seen we've done the work and we just need that push and we have got that commitment from them that you know we have they have our backs and we're just going i'm really looking forward how we can bring that forward from this day um and, and see and bring that to fruition together with everybody else here and in, involved and so uh, for now let me hand it over to mateo uh who's raised his hand go ahead mateo what an amazing two days this has been. So guys, the, the month and the sleepless night was, up to me, really, really worth it. Uh, you really did an incredible job and you did it. Of course, we support it. Of course, we're here for you, but you guys did it. Um, I listened very carefully for the past two days. I also listened very carefully to what Anne said. And I think um, there is three things that you guys have achieved. You, you work. On a, on, a, on a framework, you have presented a framework. It seemed to me that the, the framework was very well received and this posed the base for something very solid to be expanded on, right? We always say this is just the beginning of a long journey, but you demonstrated that this beginning is a good beginning. Um, I think there is the second element that I heard over and over again is that we love to do this, we love to dedicate our time, we love to volunteer our time, but this has to be supported in a more systematic way. And I mean that for all the volunteers' time that you guys have put, the sleepless night beside your work, I think that that has to be recognized, but it has to be supported in a more structured and possibly long-lasting way. If the World Food Forum is there to stay, it's there to stay because you are not just volunteering all your, all, all your free time, because I think that you deserve also some, some good equality time beside the World Food Forum, but you dedicate and you are recognized for the dedication that you put in a, in a number of different ways. And I think the, the last point that I wanted to make, or the last two points, is that, and I, and I use Hans as a reference point, I think that we need to call for a very specific set of requests if we want this to be a permanent, recognized, and one day institutional platform. If we don't make those requests at the end of the World Food Forum, I guess that we, we lose an important momentum. And Anz was very, very clear, it's like, make those requests because I am ready to support you. And Maximo is saying, make those requests because we have given the platform to you, but we need to listen to you of what these requests are all about. So I, I, I took the opportunity to reflect on when, when Anz was, was uh, uh, talking and he said, you know, we, we, you build a momentum, an incredible momentum, a global momentum, but now we have to keep it. And to, and to keep it, you need a structure, you need support, and you need also recognition. So I think that that is one of the elements that I would like you to reflect on. Um, the second element, and, and Anz is very right, we love the global, 
but let's bring it local and then we bring it back to global. And I think that now we start at global, let's bring it down <laughs> to the local. And in the building of the, the next World Food Forum, it has to go local and then bring it back uh, global. And the third and last element, and I think we have discussed that in a number of uh, uh, in a number of uh, 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 meetings, in the making of the World Food Forum, and Maximus, I think, always repeated and is right. We need fact based, we need evidence, we need some scientific group or maybe scientific youth, uh, youth group that support the work of the assembly. Because we love, we understand the action, we understand what needs to be done. But we need also some substantive and, and, and evidence and scientific approach to what we do. So if we could have, and, and I think, uh, uh, Jenna, you, you guys work a lot on that. You understand the importance of, of uh, uh, science and, and, and scientific proof. So let's bring, let's make sure that these uh, um, sci <coughs> young scientists, the World Food Forum sci scientist group work alongside with the, with the assembly to really substantiate what the assembly is producing so these are the three elements that i want i want you to reflect on because i i, I you know I, I listen i listen i listen and then i think these are the three main area that uh, that we could reflect on for the for the next 10 minutes absolutely love that i think those are very substantial um elements that we need to look into and how we can flesh that out and materialize jenna i know you have a couple of things you want to say also go ahead that I love what you just intervened, Matteo, because I had also made a list here for me uh, in my little notebook here of outcomes, of three outcomes. And I almost wrote down the three same things as you mentioned here, this um, presentation of a framework for the World Food Forum, um, the request to institutionalize, this request to go local and then bring it back up to the global level. Um, and then, of course, I think this was a thread throughout your intervention as well, but we've also through the World Food Forum, a huge outcome I think is this connection between youth groups that weren't previously working together before or between young individuals that weren't previously working together before, just simply of uh, the fact that we didn't have the chance to come in contact with each other. And I think that's one of the big values that can't be understated from the World Food Forum is this platform for collective action. Because for example, we see several people here who are tuned in from India who may be interested in working together, several folks from Egypt. I found out that Amin actually lives in Berlin. I also live in Berlin. So some of these funny coincidences wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the World Food Forum. So I love the networking aspect as well. Perfect. And I think those are things for us to look into and, and going to uh, going back to what Hans was asking for uh, from us is really how do we bring now all these um, th these lessons, these elements that we've seen these that we've observed and how we do, how do we bring them to get to a proposal that could actually be brought onto a table for funding because you know we've always been talking about you know the budget to support young people and the time that they put into it. And of course, the way that the development um, approaches work is really to like put the resources into something that brings action on the ground to life. And I think that's where the World Food Forum comes in. And I think that's very crucial that, of course, we need to prioritize what is the governance structure. That's where the governance document comes in. And this is to remind also and segue to tell our participants here, go into the documents, go into the Google Forms, sign up and then be part of the process that we're really we're work, we're looking forward to working closely with you. So that's the governance document. And the second one is to I think the actions, I think the 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 actions on the ground like what Falguni, what Amira, what Amin have been um have been bringing into the table and other young people here like Lawrence and everybody else is those can be distilled into the youth action compendium and the youth action plans. And then those can be developed into the proposals that Hans was referring to that we could bring together and 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 develop for funding. And and I think that's I think those are the low hanging fruits that we could definitely go for. Jenna, 
anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> no, thank you so much. I think that's an amazing wrap up that you just gave here of the outcomes between you, Tameo, uh, Tomaso, excuse me. <laughs> that's an amazing <laughs> wrap up of what we've been able to accomplish together in the World Food Forum. And I see Maria just wrote in the chat, the true mission of World Food Forum has come true. We must now ensure to carry it on. It feels like today is the end, but the work quite literally starts tomorrow. And so with that, I see Kazuki raised his hand. Yeah. I think it's very appropriate that he <laughs> takes the last word here um, and shares his thoughts. Oh, thanks yeah, so much. Go ahead, Kazuki. And we'd love to see your beautiful smile and passionate uh, um, expression, uh, if you could, uh, while you speak. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I would love to do that. I'm in the middle of production here, so I'm on my phone. So <laughs> please um, uh, allow me to just briefly talk and, um, and congratulate you here for this wonderful work that you have been doing um, in this Youth Action Assembly. And you will see my smile later um, in, the, in the closing ceremony because we will be all on stage and there um, I will be not on, on a phone. Um, but. Uh, uh, but I just would like to say one thing on the very last point, Jim, you were uh, you were uh, raising, and I think that is a really important one, and that was uh, coming up over and over in the different discussions, is on budget and on funding and um, and the possibilities of doing resource mobilization. And I think this platform that we have been putting together here, this network, and Jenna, you're saying networking amongst all of the different youth groups is so powerful. It's so empowering this network and this platform has also much more of an opportunity for getting funding because we are together because we are combining our ideas because we are combining our powers from all around the world but also at the local level um, in the next step so i believe there is uh, a lot that we have to bring to this closing ceremony at the closing ceremony, the full fledged senior management of the Rome based uh, of FAO at least is uh, going to be there. And I'm, I hope that the, the other Rome based agencies will be all watching as well. <laughs> and um, so you have here now an, an, a unique opportunity to bring your actions, your ideas, very concrete institutionalization of this place. Um, make the network real, and then ask, of course, also for the money that is necessary for it um, uh, to the table um, today at five o'clock. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, be concrete, um, be bold. I think we nobody here um, is holding back, and this is really where um, where the boldness needs to come in place. Um, and um, uh, Sometimes you ask 150% and then you get 120. But if you only eight, uh, ask for 80%, you will probably only get 50. So ask for what your dream is. Ask for what the, what, what the long-term vision is all about here. And I think that is really uh, important. And um, my feeling from what came out of this assembly is that that is where we are and that is where um, uh, the, uh, the next steps are going. But again, from... Um, from my side, thanks to the incredible volunteering that went into this assembly. And um, uh, uh, Jim, you will see my face later and I will smile, I promise. <laughs> Back to you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Uh, absolutely lovely way to end it and cap it off from the World Food Forum coordinator. Um, again, a round of applause to everybody who's worked uh, from the FAO team, from the volunteers, uh, from, the, from the people leading and people working behind the scenes. An amazing uh, thank you also to our interpreters who through the technical issues a while ago, we've gone through that and we've achieved this and, we, and we've, we've reached this point. So to close, this is not the ending. This is just the beginning. And, and we do have a closing ceremony. We also have the launch of the Foodicons coming up um, at, at 1300 uh, Central European time. That's also an amazing um, initiative. And so again, go and attend the closing ceremony also. And that's where we're going to do a lot of our, uh, put at least our 
our calls, our demands, and also share that um that that passion with everybody else. So, uh, with that, oh, is there something that you wanted to say, Mateo? Yeah, I would like everyone, all the members. Let let's bring everybody up. Put your camera on. Let's make a beautiful and uh, and smiley picture. We will take off the mask for a couple of seconds just for the picture. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I, the, 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 the Roman police say no. But let's bring, <laughs> let's bring everybody up. Let everybody put on the, the camera and let's make a proper wall foot form smile for this beautiful, beautiful end of the morning. And please, as while we're doing that, yes, let me join uh, Jim by calling all of you to attend the Foodicons meeting. This is where we're going to discuss icons that are related to the food system. They're going to help us better communicating across cultural languages and uh, ge geographies. Uh, but also do join us for the closing ceremony at 5 p.m. where our young leaders are going to make some proper, proper requests <laughs> to all the FAO management and to the world, all the, the people that are listening to the World Food Forum. So bring your camera up. Oh, so you're taking the picture? I do that. Who does it? Somebody taking the picture already? <laughs> I see some people are still coming on, so maybe let's Okay, we'll we'll wait okay. we'll wait a few more minutes. Yeah, I'm still trying to promote everybody to panelists, uh, participants. If you see and you want to turn on your camera, just accept the invite to be promoted to panelist. Um, and if not, it's okay. It's totally fine. And we understand. We're just happy that you've been here and that you've participated. Exactly. Just try to put your camera on so we see some beautiful smile and faces. And we can make the last World Food for Mute Assembly picture for today. Okay, more people coming in. All right. If you want to be in the picture, please turn on your camera. That's the only request. Yeah. Put your camera on. Yes, exactly. That's lovely. Okay. Nice. It's nice to see people with their beautiful faces and smiles. <laughs> I sent an okay. invitation for everyone to be a panelist. So I think those who would like to join are here. Okay. We have more coming in. Please turn on your cameras so that we can include you in the picture. Yeah. All right. All right. Three, two, one. Smile. <laughs> Fantastic. Gorgeous. See you all at five, people. Thank you so much. It's a wrap for the Youth Action Assembly. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, every single person in this room. Tune in at five. Pleasure. See you Thank all. Thank you so everyone. much. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Talk everyone. Work.
Maurizio? Ciao Ivan, buongiorno. Ciao sì. Maurizio, tutto bene? Bene, tu? Bene, bene, grazie. Posso provare a mandarti il video? Mi dici come si vede, come si sente? Sì, mandalo, dai. Vado, eh, che non c'è nessuno ancora. Mi sono scordato pure il telefono oggi. <ride> che, fe- che genio. Vado, eh. Vai. Allora, metto full screen. Lo senti? Sì, sì, lo, lo sento, lo vedo bene, Ivan. No, non scatta. Ok. No, non mi sembra che scatta, no. Una cosa sopra, sola, tu lo vedi full screen, ma sopra lo vedi quella barra nera che c'ho io? Sì, no? io vedo la barra nera, non so perché. No, scusa, non la barra nera proprio, con, dico, sì, quella con sì. più sì. video participants, quella lì. Sì, e non so perché. Vedi sì. proprio quella? Con chat, questo non è l'answer, quello sì. lì? Eh, quella come faccio? Togliere. Se faccio così la vedi che si sposta giù, giusto? Sì. Eh, non te lo so c'è. dire perché Ivan eh, tu c'hai pure la camera ah, ecco, hide floating meeting controls mi sa, ecco così non lo vedi più la vedo in mezzo la vedi in mezzo? sì, la vedo in mezzo, in mezzo, adesso sei andata non vedi perché Ivan, non lo so, a volte fa non lo so perché a volte fa così, però lo fa ah. va bene, va bene non è un grosso problema, no? Cioè, no, 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 ma sta riunione com'è? Eh? però se faccio hide Adesso non lo vedi, è andato via, no? No, no, adesso sta sempre in mezzo. In mezzo e poi dopo un po' va via, mi sa. E dovrebbe andare via, dopo un po' mi sembra che... Sì, adesso è andata via, dai. Allora, allora faccio così, guarda come faccio, aspetta, eh. allora stop un attimo. Allora faccio così, faccio. Share. Aspetta, stop. Allora. Faccio share. Ehm, questo. Ah, io chi è? Aspetta, aspetta, questo non serve. E quest'altro che c'ho. Hide, così non li dovresti più vedere e poi parto col video, giusto? Io la vedo un attimo e mezzo e poi dovrebbe andare, andare via, dai. Aspetto 5 secondi e poi lo faccio. Sì, partire. sì, sì, sì. Quando devo fare, ok. E niente, sto meeting come deve essere? Non lo so. Adesso vediamo un attimo quando comincio. Ancora non mi hanno dato i gradi da, da gestire il meeting, tra un po' mi daranno, dai. Ok, va bene. A dopo. Grazie, ciao. Ciao, Ivan, ciao, ciao.
Good morning. Hey Nathan, is um uh you mentioned Ali would be introducing some of the designers? Yes, Ali uh, will. All right, perfect. Good morning, Robin. How awesome to see that you could make it. For whatever pain you're in, it's four o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> and yesterday, Jim had us do it at 2 a.m. because they had to start really early. I didn't even go back to bed. I just Hi, stayed Douglas. at home. How are you? Hey, Maximo. Hi, Maximo. Hi. Why well, you are not sleeping, Douglas? I am, I am on my feet sleeping. Maximo, I want to introduce you to Robin Metcalf, who's been an inspiration to- Hi, Robin. Uh, I have I, seen her in all the videos. Yes, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. And also Nathan, uh, I have seen all of you. Thank you so much. Oh, you never met, uh, Maximo, you never met Nathan until just now? Yeah. Um, yeah, virtually only. <laughs> We're legendary to each other. Yeah. <laughs> you see, Maximo, Nathan is like the guy that got the invitation to the dinner party and wore the proper clothing. He has the right background. See that? <laughs> Everyone else is just like, we just made it. Somehow we got here. <laughs> Ellie and I, yeah, both. Yeah, Ellie also. <laughs> well, Ellie has a background too? Yes. Interesting how they kind of uh, work together as a team, those two. So. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, Maximo, it's also four o'clock in the morning for Chloe, too. Yeah, I saw her. <laughs> yeah. So are you happy that this is at the end now, Maximo? This is the last day, right? Last event? Today, today I am not happy until the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, We're Maximo, I, Nathan, we have to really screw this up <laughs> for, for Maximo at the end. We've got to... Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> but I, I trust 100% know is... my youth team, so... Is Sting singing? Is anyone singing at the end? <laughs> That's what we'll do. I'm going to play Roxanne at the end. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Better get those rights to, to broadcast. He doesn't have the rights, so he cannot broadcast it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My youth team will immediately block the sound. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it'll be cool uh, when you can do it in person, hopefully next year, you know? That will be really awesome. So, but congratulations for pulling this together during COVID because uh, I can only imagine it wasn't easy, you know? Yeah, the decision to do it 100% virtual only was four weeks ago. I know that, I know that. Yeah. I remember you were, you were I, was in, I was in meetings where people talked about live and not live and how they were gonna organize that. So, but ultimately you probably was the right decision, right? So. Oh yes, it was, I think. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to have the concert in front of Circo Massimo, but uh, he will come. <laughs> well, this is what they call in Italian. This is the antipasto. So. Yeah. so. Perfect. Okay. So, Chloe, will you be sharing your screen um, later, or will it? Who uh, will it'll be Douglas. But I, right. I will share my screen for sure. All right, perfect. Jim, I will share the video at the start, yes? Sorry, my phone doesn't work. Yeah. Um, you, you will introduce... Yeah, we have a video right before I hand it over to Maximo. We'll have the video. Right at the beginning, let's say. Thank you. I will share that. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. All right. Are we good to go? Uh. We don't have a microphone like yours. Yeah. <laughs> we also don't have Viksha on the line yet, but I just emailed okay. her a link. All right, we'll wait then. <clears throat> you might have to pull her out of the crowd, right? Because she won't have the right present. She won't have a participant link. Uh, I just sent her the link I use, so maybe that'll work. Shoot. Ciao, Matteo. Siamo al... Siamo arrivata alla frutta. There's a phrase, uh, Robin, in Italian, which is, 
you say, we have arrived at the fruit, which means <laughs> it's the last thing that's served at the dinner. And when I did a book about Tuscany, the very last image of the book was an image of uh, two men at a table peeling an orange at the end of their meal. Siamo arrivato alla frutta. Do you still use that term, Matteo? Some days, when appropriate, absolutely yes. <laughs> well, it would be appropriate right it, now, right? It would be appropriate right now, very much so. <laughs> how, has the, how has the rest of the summit been? It, it, it's been great. I, I think that we start to have people connecting. Um, and the registration has started. Maybe, maybe we can have a, a, a chat after, after the session. I would love to bring you up to speed. Fantastic. Great. Got it. Jim, the floor is yours. All right. I see Viksha here already as a panelist. And we're good to go. All right. So good evening from the Philippines. Good afternoon to those in uh, Italy and Central European time and uh, and everybody else in the middle of the world. And good morning to those in the earlier part of the world uh, with uh, Douglas and everybody else, Chloe and everybody here. Good morning to you all. And um, good day to anybody who's here in, the, in this call right now. And so my name is Jim, and I'm working closely with the World Food Farm, uh, specifically in the Youth Action Assembly. And I'm very happy and privileged to be here with the Food Econs Lounge. This is a very exciting session that's up for you guys so to introduce quickly uh just an overview of what the food econs is food econs is a global challenge sponsored by adobe the lexicon aiga and the noun project to create a visual language of food an iconic iconographic language can help communicate more universally across borders languages and backgrounds Farmers, food producers, retailers, and consumers will be able to use the open source icons as a shared language to depict everything from basic elements like water and peanuts to more complex concepts like no-till farming and buffer strips. Today, we'll share how designers have come together to design these icons in collaboration with food experts from around the world and showcase examples of how they can be used. Finally, learn how you can join us in creating this visual language of food in a new partnership between Foodicons and the World Food Forum. And with that, there we're going to have a video just to introduce the Foodicons. you're going to create a truly global food culture where everyone is represented, the first thing you probably have to do is come up with a language that is shared. It's probably not going to be words. It's probably going to be images, icons. Foodicons is a way of overcoming at least partially linguistic and geographic barriers. It's an ambitious project meant to serve people throughout and across the food system from consumers to professionals of all kinds. What we decided to do was draft designers and food system experts from all over the world to join us in that journey, to create a truly universal language that can be shared by everybody in our food systems. I really like this double uh, mission here. If I speak Hindi, that's my first language, and you speak English, even if you see one particular icon, we are literate in that same language. Yo creo que es super relevante, importante tener una alternativa más de de un lenguaje más allá de del escrito o del hablado. Y por eso yo creo que creo que los iconos son una parte importante de la cultura actual. Foodicons has a process where artists and designers create icons, but then go through a series of steps 
where they receive feedback from design experts, but also food system experts. And these designers have done a, a terrific job trying to interpret it in a way that is both simple, but yet informative. Not only are we crowdsourcing these icons from people all over the, the world, but they're all going to be open source. There's going to be no limitations on anyone in the world using them for essentially any kind of practice. I think timing is everything. And I think this is that moment where people want to be part of something bigger than themselves and want to contribute to something that has a high degree of utility. It's really important to me to work for something greater than just myself, my country, or my culture, and be certain what we do here um, bring values for everybody in the world. It's clear that there's a visual language evolving that is teaching us how all these terms can relate to each other. And the most exciting part of this project has yet to happen, and that's seeing how people all over the world use them. We expect to see uses we haven't even imagined as people communicate how they work and eat to all kinds of stakeholders. Our mission at the World Food Forum is to support and empower the next generation to create a better food future for the world. And to do that, we need a language that all people can use a visual language like this. All right, welcome to the to the launch of the Food Icons and this is an absolutely exciting initiative of different stakeholders coming together. Um, in fact, the Youth Action Assembly has already used some of the, of the food icons in the compendium that we've written over the past two months and we presented in the past two days. And so some of the food icons were launched, uh, seen there already. So without further ado, let me hand over the floor to the Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And prior to joining FAO, he served in other intergovernmental organizations, such as an executive director for World Bank Group, spanning several Latin American countries, and also as lead for the International Food Policy Research Institute's Division on Markets, Trade, and Institutions. I've come to know Maximo as the chair of the FAO Youth Committee and the advisory board for the World Food Forum, um, of which the Youth Action Assembly has been working closely with. And without further ado, Maximo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, and thank you all for, for being here. Uh, several months ago, I think, several now, I met uh, Douglas more than a year uh, when the summit started. And, and I started to learn a lot, many things uh, they were doing with his team. And, and I was really, really impressed. And we started working together in many topics. But these food icons, which which they have uh, been working so much, and, and which now we are we are launching here with the with the youth uh, group with the World Food Forum, I think is something amazing. It's something completely different, uh, and it's something that that for me uh, brings a solution to a huge problem that we face. Always, I have been working on digital technologies for most of my life, but uh, I always talk about the three C's: uh, connectivity content and capabilities. So connectivity are cables and prices. We can resolve that problem. There is no, no issue. And, and we are trying to push with, the, with, the, with many initiatives uh, with ITU to try to resolve the connectivity problem. There is a price tag for that. We can do it. Uh, content also, there is science, there is evidence that we can work. But capabilities, capabilities of our rural people, which are facing significant challenges of illiteracy, is something that will take generations to resolve. And here is when I, when I think food icons, this visual language can change completely the way we see this problem. Because through the food the icons uh, and for this new language, which is based on crowdsourcing, but much more than that, uh, we can revolutionize and resolve this huge challenge of capabilities that we have. So I really believe uh, this initiative uh, can really give us a huge push in the transformation we need to, to use and to do now uh, using digital technologies, using automation. And it can resolve a major challenge that we have of capabilities, uh, which will have take us generations to resolve. And, and the beauty of it is it's not just a, a drawing, it's not just an image which reflects 
a content, but it has a content behind, but also has science behind, which is what really makes it a real language, a real visual language. And for FAO, that's great. You know, we handle codex alimentarius. We handle all these certification mechanisms. We, we do this. So, so for us to be able to link in the science part, uh, to keep improving the, the food icons and to keep pushing for this visual language is a huge, huge, huge thing. And I am so happy that the World Food Forum and the youth immediately took this up and immediately understood the power of this. I am even more happy that you are using it in your compendium. Uh, so thank you very much for, for this. I won't take longer, but please see of this as a huge transformation. Uh, what we were calling the summit game changers. For me, this is a real game changer. If we do it, if we keep expanding it, we keep doing the crowdsourcing as, as, as the video showed, uh, there is enormous potential that, that we need to keep empowering. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm back to you, Jim. Thank you, Maximo. And uh, definitely this is a very exciting um, initiative with stakeholders coming together with the World Food Forum, bring it forward. And now we want to know more about the food icons, how they came to be, and no better people to, to give that explanation and elaboration other than the people behind it. Nathan and Douglas. And first off with Nathan, Nathan is a serial entrepreneur, a business strategist, and an education innovator, an author, and a speaker. He's a serial entrepreneur in various technology and strategic sectors, and has written over 10 books, started more than six companies, and founded the Groundbreaking Design MBA program. He's focused on building new tools for strategy and communication and leads the Foodicons Challenge an initiative for building a global open source iconographic system for food systems. Nathan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to be here, Jim. And uh, I think the actually the first person to talk should be Douglas because he started this entire project. Uh, I got a call about two years ago now um, to uh, come on board to this project and help it uh, to be realized. Um, and uh, Douglas is the one that instigated all of it because he was in the midst of so many overlapping food systems and saw the need for this uh, new global visual language. So let me call on Douglas, who's also an award-winning information architect, filmmaker, photographer, and writer. And in the past days that I've come to know him, you could feel that passion for this food icons just oozing out of it. So Douglas, go ahead and just spread that love and energy for, for the food icons with everybody. There are over 190 nations that uh, uh, comprise uh, the membership of FAO. Uh, each of these nations have multiple cultures within them. Uh, food defines those cultures. And yet we don't have a universal language that can bind and find the universality that exists that can bring us together. Food can be that glue culturally, but we need to have a way to communicate that crosses physical boundaries and borders and language boundaries and borders. Uh, to date, there really hasn't been an attempt to do that. And what we thought to do was to create a mechanism that could bring people together, not only in a shared language, but also to raise their literacy. Uh, we run an accelerator program called Green, Brown, Blue at my organization, which is called the Lexicon. And that accelerator brings together experts from all over the world to look at great challenges facing our food systems. And we said, you know, could we create this universal language? Of course, for us, there was really nobody better than Nathan um, to lead that given his decades of expertise in design uh, and also his um, decades of expertise in the food space. So he was one of those unique people that wore two hats. What we did was we brought together a series of food system experts, a series of designers and said, how can we create the own language? And then we afterwards, uh, Nathan took this to Adobe and the a design team at, at, at Adobe said, we can create a generalized framework that will allow people to follow that framework and have a, an, an icon that will look exactly the same, whether it was done by one hand or many hands. From that point, uh, we made the decision that, you know, you know, Nathan felt this could be a global challenge and it could be something that the world could take part in. And I've been amazed at what Nathan has put together over the past year. And Nathan, why, why don't you share 
um, how you put together the challenge and how it's manifested itself over the past, um, you know, Nathan, it's only uh, eight or nine months, if you can believe that. Yeah. Really, it's true. Thank you, Douglas. So uh, I think the first challenge started in January of this year, and uh, already we have 600, over 600 icons built. Um, they're all available today from the foodicons.org website, in fact, and we have more in the works. Uh, we knew that this was, we knew that no one was going to uh, fund a project this big. This may, in fact, be the biggest design project in the world, um, at least certainly in recent history. We knew that uh, it was a lot of work and that the only real way to build a global language is to use designers from all over the world and get their input and perspective. Um, and we knew we're, we were gonna have to crowdsource it if we wanted it to happen. Uh, so we, we looked at a bunch of uh, different alternatives about how to run a challenge of this, uh, of this size. Um, and of, the, of this type uh, and decided that uh, the tools that were accessible out there in the world, namely uh, Google Drive, for instance, uh, were gonna be, we could build an entire system to run these challenges given uh, the tools that were available globally to people essentially all over the world. So we built a, a, a system within Google Drive to manage a design process. And for those of you who may not be familiar, a, a, a typical design process, one of the most important pieces of that is the idea of critique. And it's an essential part of creating anything and making it better and having multiple perspectives on it in order to uh, make something as great as it can be. So we built in a process uh, and built it into our system so that there would be three rounds of critique for all of the challenges. And those critique were coming from uh, two different groups, a, a set of uh, designers, very experienced icon designers in particular. So that was our design council and a set of food experts. Um, so that was sort of our food judges. And at every point uh, in these three cycles, the designers would get input from food experts about the, the, the things that they were uh, sketching and designing as icons as well as design expertise and design critique from the designers. So these two forces helped create, uh, um, I guess, uh, helped improve the quality of uh, what we were able to create. So we've run four different challenges. We have a challenge open right now. And as I said, there's 600 icons in the system. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing work. And it's really mm. exciting to see how this is going to move forward. And so to go further into that and taking off from what uh, Nathan was just talking about, about the design and also the food systems, um, we're going to jump in and break those, break those into two. And we're going to start off with the food systems experts and like the need for a shared language and to know more about that we have two of our food experts here with us. And I'm going to start off with Robin Metcalf, who's a lecturer and professor of instruction in the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. She's an author, film producer, and researcher who explores our global food system. She was the founder and director of Food Plus City, an innovative project that explored the future of our food system and produced a food startup challenge in Austin, Texas. And she's written lots of books on food and she has this really uh, credibility towards food systems. So Robin is one of our food systems experts and we have Romano Di Vivo, who is also a dedicated and resourceful leader with 20 years of global experience in sustainability, public policy, communications, and in-depth knowledge of governance, international law, and market dynamics. He brings a mature, profound grasp of the agribusiness sector and multi-stakeholder partnerships. And currently, he coordinates the second International Congress on Agrobiodiversity on behalf of CGIAR. All right. So I'm going to jump into questions for both of our experts who are here right now. And um, just to know more about the process of at least um, you coming in. And first of all, to Robin, the question is, what is one of the biggest challenges facing our supply chains? 
Well, thank you. And thank you, Jim. And thank you also to um, both Nathan and Douglas um, for making this all happen, because it really takes that kind of leadership to pull it all together. Um, this food supply chain has been invisible to, to most everybody, uh, really up to this point. This is, the, this is, this is as, as Douglas pointed out in the video, this is its moment uh, to, be, to you know, be something that we can really all engage in. Um, there's really a lack of transparency. People really know about what's going on at the table much more these days and also what's going on in the ground, but very little about what goes on in between. And unless we can have a conversation where we can, we can really talk across the whole landscape of the food system, we're never really going to reach a point where we really can solve the, the, all the friction points and, and the key problems in the food system. So um, I, I think I, this, is, this project will really open the, the gates to um, a much broader and much more textured conversation about the food system. Um, and, um, and it's in much need of, of attention. So this is, this is a great moment. Thank you. That's a succinct uh, description of what needs to be addressed across supply chains, especially food systems. And now over to Romano. Um, how, how do we use food icons or how can food icons be used to explain something as complex as agrobiodiversity? Thanks, Jim. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic question because uh, clearly uh, I came here as a practitioner. So in the second International Agrobiodiversity Congress, we try to explain uh, agrobiodiversity implications for consumption, production and conservation. And clearly, I mean, we involve uh, uh, experts, but also um, practitioners, uh, policymakers, and even consumers. So uh, it's very difficult to find the, the, the right words to explain all the different concepts. And also sometimes words uh, are uh, a little bit taken uh, hostage of uh, a number of political positions. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to find uh, the right compromise when you are writing a declaration or when you are trying to uh, agree on a common position with uh, several different stakeholders. So to have an icon that explains the practice, that shows the next level, that tells everybody what it means, the implications, the impact, this is a fantastic way of communicating and uh, also bridging uh, from science to policy uh, to consumers. And this is really powerful. I never really experienced something so exciting. Uh, and I'm very, uh, really uh, grateful to Douglas and Nathan uh, for this uh, great opportunity of uh, using uh, their icons in, uh, in our Congress. Thanks, thank you for that um, elaboration. And um, I think um, at this point, I also wanna do a quick follow-up on maybe each one of you very quickly before we go on to the next segment. And um, going back to Robin about the, you know, across food supply chains and having this kind of visual language um, in your years of expertise, or at least your experience, is this something that could definitely, in, you know, change consumer awareness? You know, as, as we talk about supply chains, it's really in between from the production to consumption, but when it gets down to the line of consumption, is it something that could really enhance that understanding through the transparency of a language across what the issues are, how food is being produced and all, is, all of these things? What, what do you think about that? Well, I'm hopeful. Um, I think this is a tool that people haven't had um, up to this point to sort of bridge differences because um, as we already mentioned, food is a a deeply cultural and emotional um, uh, conversation. And people have been sort of standing over in their corners, uh, defending their, their own points of view and, and really haven't been able to, to cross the barriers into a really shared conversation. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, here at the University of Texas, we're teaching a course called Global Food Systems Design. And I look forward to introducing this language to the students um, and so I think beginning there um, is a bright light in the possibilities of, of reaching um, a consumer awareness. So very optimistic. Lovely. That's lovely to hear. And just thinking about the potential 
is immense. Going to Romano, you know, talking about agro biodiversity being explained through food icons. And, you know, something when we talk about um, food production systems, you know, sometimes it can be very complex for people to, to grasp um, over just a cup of coffee, perhaps. But, um, and, and, you know, people have also different beliefs in coming into the way they produce their food. And so how do you think visual language like this can also be a, a, a way to bridge between people's beliefs and understanding of what food production systems are fit for their context? Absolutely. I think we, we are talking about uh, food systems transformation. And clearly a transformation implies uh, collaboration from all stakeholders. And clearly they, they need to understand immediately and visualize immediately what is the idea. And uh, clearly if uh, um, we align uh, production to certain values, so to the values of the SDGs, I mean, we still need then to, to align uh, consumption to the same values and make sure that things can really work together. So uh, icons for the very first time, I believe, are giving this sort of opportunity. So it's really a common language. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, uh, we know how a common language for, can facilitate these things. I mean, we are all speaking English now in this forum. And uh, this is uh, the, 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 a very good way to be effective. In agrobiodiversity, because of the complexity, and because we are touching really very specific activities that uh, are part of our everyday life. I mean, to have the icons, it's even more powerful. And I fully agree on, uh, on what Robin said. I mean, we can remove the barriers. We can really bridge uh, from positions to other positions and make sure that people uh, have a better understanding and a common understanding of what we mean. Absolutely. Wow. Amazing. Thank you very much, Robin and Romano, for bringing that insight into the food systems aspect that goes into these icons. And so now moving and shifting from that perspective of the food icons, going now into the design process, let me now bring back uh, to the floor and hand it over to Nathan, who will talk about the process of developing these food icons. So Nathan, over to you and for Douglas. Uh, together to work together on that. Go ahead, Nathan, you have the floor. Sure, thank you, Jim. Uh, I wanted to step people through how the, the Foodicon design system works, um, a little bit about uh, how uh, designers design the icons themselves, and then show some of the work because that's why we're here. We also have one of our star designers online um, and uh, Ellie, uh, who's one of our volunteers who's just been incredible. She's an incredible designer here in San Francisco. We'll interview Viksha uh, about her process as well. Uh, this is a really uh, quick overview of how uh, we've helped build a system to allow designers all over the world to design within a system so that when the, they submit their final icons, they all work as a family, which is one of the essential pieces of an iconographic uh, system. So We've asked designers to select, we, when, they, when they register for the challenge, they get a set of terms. Uh, these terms are in a family. If they absolutely hate their terms, they can contact us and get a new set. Uh, we've only ever had that once though. And then they're off to sketch for a few weeks. Um, they, they upload their sketches uh, to workbooks. Everyone is given a personal workbook. And then we take all of the work and uh, copy it off into judging workbooks so that our design and food experts can uh, overlay their critique about uh, the sketches. We build uh, some, we, we provide the designers with uh, icon templates and libraries of, of common elements, which I'll show you in a second. We have an incredible set of design guidelines. And then when they get this feedback, they then take off on the design round, which is only two weeks long. They submit their uh, designs and then they get more critique over a week. And then they have one final week of refinement of their design. So an entire challenge really takes place in just about a month and a half, um, maybe a little bit longer, which is not a lot of time, essentially because, especially because some of these terms are, as you all know, in the food system, uh, fairly abstract and complex. 
Uh, we were really fortunate early on to uh, catch the attention of Adobe and specifically their global design, their global icon design team. Um, and so two of their designers, Nayani D'Souza Hablitzel and uh, Isabel Hamlin built the, the design guidelines for the system. Um, it's an incredibly versatile set of uh, design tools and design attributes so that when you have 150, 250 designers working independently, when their work comes together, it fits as a system. And so they developed all of the guidelines here. Um, and I'm stepping through some of these. You can see these all on the Fudicon site. They specified um, things like corner radiuses and how to use negative and positive space. And then they built a uh, icon template. So all of our designers, even though they didn't have to work in Adobe Illustrator, for instance, they could download a icon template with a lot of these attributes built in. Um, they also built this uh, fantastic um, library of elements, including modifiers. And I'll get to that in a second because the modifiers over time became part of this evolving language. How the modifiers apply to an icon really slightly changes the meaning and allowed us to create an extensive system. Um, we also in, in this library have lots of common elements, certainly it's the first icons that Adobe developed as they were developing uh, the guidelines and the system itself. And these elements then became instrumental in helping our uh, designers all over the world um, explain the, the difficult or the complex terms that they were given. Many of these elements came to mean um, specific things and really were the basis of the language that is developing now. Um, and it is a language. Uh, at the heart, many of these icons really clearly describe complex things. These are some of my favorite icons from, from the last challenge. The, the difference between a genotype and a phenotype is something that, you know, maybe scientists and, and, and enthusiasts know, but is a pretty complex, very subtle thing, but incredibly important, right, in conservation of food. Um, and, and the designer of these, I think this was Kathleen Foster in Australia, I thought did just an, a brilliant job differentiating these. I should say that the goal of these icons and any icon system for that matter, isn't so much to immediately understand something, it's to make something that's easily learnable and rememberable. So while you know my mother seeing these two type icon, top icons might not get genotype and phenotype, someone that uses those, someone that has a need for them would easily learn and then be able to differentiate them. Biomimicry is another one, colony collapse syndrome, um, these really express the heart of what the um, what the these terms mean and the importance of them. Here is an example that emerged during the challenges where the icon for a hand out holding something has become um, has has now taken on the meaning of care or maintenance or management. And so a bird sitting in the hand is bird friendly, a water drop above it becomes water management, fire management, manure management, et cetera. And this is really the crux of what happens when, when you have iconographic languages, they start to build their own grammar. And then that grammar is extensible and applicable to other kinds of terms. Um, here's another example of, or a few examples of some of these things that, um, over and over with use are coming to mean things. So the two hands together are, are, have come to mean in this visual language equity. So if you put different things in the hands, it modifies the kind of equity it is. Or in the second row, this idea of uh, ownership of a farm, these two piece elements, the, the deed element, um, the farm element, and then replacing the person helps people understand the differences. And, and when we show you the uses that are already being used, um, you'll see why it's important to have some of these icons. The last one I like because um, it's a system that these icons work together with each other to help differentiate the different kinds of uh, 
cases of where they might be used. Uh, I should introduce Ellie here. Um, Ellie is one of our volunteers, one, one of our very few uh, volunteers. She has done an incredible amount of work. She's a fantastic designer here in San Francisco as well. And she has helped us manage this process, communicating with the judges, communicating with all these designers, um, uploading designs and, and refining them, et cetera. We could not have done this without her. And she's gonna step us through some of the um, star design work that we've seen, as well as once we get to the end, uh, we have Viksha here who is calling in from India and she is one, absolutely one of our top star designers where we feel so uh, grateful to have this, well, for us, we've discovered her. She's always been a designer out there in the world, but we're so grateful because her work is so sensitively uh, put together and is just stellar. So Ellie, take it away. Hi, Nathan, thank you. Um, can you help me scroll the slides while I was talking? Yeah, just tell me when. Yeah, of course. Um, so at the launch of the Food Icons, we actively reach out to design communities and institutions to share this opportunity across the globe. So up till now, we have seen more than 750 designers from over 80 countries and regions sign up for our challenges. Food Icons values diversity a lot and the fact that we welcome designers of different age, gender, ethnicity, and culture really makes this project a true worldwide collaboration. So in the following slides, I'm gonna show design works from some of our featured designers who will devote their passion and skills to create these excellent food icons. Next, please. So for example, here we have the Philippa from Portugal who designed terms like fisher person, farm laborer, rancher, inspector. And next one. Next one, please. Alejandra from USA. So she designed a couple of um, chef, server, butcher, eaters. As you can see, both of these designers are really great at designing icons associated with diverse people elements. Next, we have Liz from Mexico creating icons for culinary and climate change terms. So they are like um, climate change, climate mitigation, uh, as well as gen vegetarian. Next, we have Lohan from Belgium designing icons such as um, genetically modified organisms and dietary guidelines. Next, Li Xing from China who created icons for animal proteins and other uh, food terms. Next, we have Kathleen as um, Nathan mentioned previously, she created some uh, icons that is related to genetics and allergies. So as we can see, some of these designers were assigned to some quite complicated terms as mentioned before, like phenotype, genotype, but they all managed to develop really unique icons that work as a cohesive set of visual assets for our better food communications. Today, we are also very honored to invite one of these amazing designers, Viksha from India, to talk about her experience and work with food icons. Hi, Viksha. Hi, Ali. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am an architecture student from India. My name is Viksha Mandarita. And uh, I'm curious about the multidisciplinary scopes of architecture. And I'm, in, I'm not designing uh, spatial experiences. I enjoy making posters and uh, exploring type, uh, in terms of typography, posters, and uh, material explorations. Impressive. Uh, so before this project, did you have any design experience with food specifically? Uh, no, this was actually the first time I was interacting with food systems. And I learned that uh, creating a legible and transparent system uh, could contribute to a greater food uh, literacy. And personally, as a consumer among various shareholders like producers and farmers, as a consumer personally, I have uh, understood and uh, I'm more aware of what I am uh, putting on the table. Great. Um, so how do you like about this new experience, like compared to um, the previous experience that you mentioned, like designing posters and other design process? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, this was the first time that I was working uh, remotely with uh, people around the world and also the kind of uh, impact that it creates around the globe uh, is very impressive and I'm honored to be part of this uh, project of such a grand scale. Thank you. Um, so before the start of designing any icons, where did you find any design inspirations? Are there any like imagery, photography, or real life references that you looked into? So usually when I look for design inspirations, it was uh, in the middle when I was having like a creative block. So uh, in the start of the process, I usually like write down all the terms and uh, under each term, I write what kind of elements uh, uh, there are that the uh, term must communicate in order to have uh, uh, a holistic approach to that term. So uh, for that creative block, I think I got the inspiration from, you know, changing the, uh, changing the scene of where I'm uh, sketching, for example, going to another room or just taking a walk outside. Um, another thing is also uh, interacting with uh, other people who are not designers. So people who are not, uh, you know, uh, aiming to design an icon, they would describe the term in a very different way. So uh, their concepts and how they're approaching and uh, ideating that kind of uh, term in their uh, daily life would be a much better approach to designing the icon, which is used by uh, so many people, not just designers. So that was a, uh, a better way to uh, for me to approach the design process. Got it. It's very important to understand your target audience before you actually do the design, right? Exactly. Um, so during the process, do you find anything that is very challenging for you to um, kind of accomplish these kind of icons? Uh, so before starting, I was uh, in the challenge one, I was like, you know, I don't know how to start, start from, starting from scratch and, you know, brainstorming, having the blue sky ideas. I, I wasn't really sure how to get started. But once I went through the first challenge to the fifth challenge, I realized that, uh, you know, having a repository, having a library before, uh, you know, with all the selected terms was even more essential to relate the newer terms back to the terms which are already there in the library. So uh, I think relating that uh, uh, again and again and uh, trying to see if the, the newer terms could be related to another term in the previous deck was also possible. So that would create a much more unified family of items. So this was the most challenging, but also uh, the most rewarding part of the process. Mm -hmm. Great. So some of your icons, I just noticed that a little bit harder to express than the others. Um, do you have any steps that help you to sketch out these complex ideas and to make them more understandable as the others? Uh, so for example, the second icon in the top row, that is an icon for the uh, buffer strip. So being an architecture student, I've already learned about this in my class. And I realized that having too much information and uh, too much background about the term was also, uh, you know, really hindering because uh, I was trying to put all the uh, uh, you know, concerned uh, elements into it, but it was getting too abstract. And especially for this uh, icon, it was challenging because uh, for the first and the second round, I realized that, uh, you know, the critique I was getting was like, uh, the first one is better than the second one. So um, I understood that it was important to not keep the icons more abstract and busy, but rather create a much more uh, minimalistic and simple uh, Icon. So, for example, uh, for this uh, buffer strip, I remember I was uh, sketching for the last day till the end of the submission round. I was just like, I need to get this term. I was least concerned about this. And this was the term which was getting to me. I was like, how am I not able to express this clearly? So that was the <laughs> fun part about this. Yeah, so there's a lot of like back and forth. And when you kind of uh, look at the critics and see where the improvement can be. Exactly. Okay, um, so is there a particular favorite icon here on the slide that you can talk about and why do you like it so much? I think it's again the buffer strip. I, I just <laughs> said everything that I wanted to for that but then the reason why I liked it is because um, it changed my design process. I understood that uh, for this particular like the previous design projects I understood that I need to do a little more of research, a little more background study but for something which is so minimalistic and uh, which needs to be uh, there should be uh, subtractive elements rather than adding everything into it. I uh, learned a lot from this icon. I think that is why it's my uh, favorite. And also looking uh, at all the icons, this is the most aesthetic and, you know, it looks very unified. So I like it the most. Mm -hmm. Your icons are amazingly designed. 
Can you Thank share you. with us some tips that will help create successful food icons? Um, I think uh, you would also agree, Ali, that as designers, we all have a design process. And uh, for each project, we need to uh, learn, unlearn, and then relearn again how to best fit our process into that particular project. So I think uh, understanding your own design process and uh, understanding how you can uh, perform the best in that particular deadline, uh, so to say, and also uh, what is uh, expected out of that icon, I think that's the... Uh, most important part about this project, but also uh, having subtractive elements, just uh, trying to keep it more minimalistic and not making it too busy or abstract. So I think uh, that's what I learned from this. Got it. It's super important to make these icons as a cohesive set so that people can understand them as they see them. So thank you so much for sharing today. Um, I believe that your experience will definitely inspire more emerging designers to help advance our global food system. So I'm going to pass it off to Douglas again to talk about uses for food icons. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show some examples of what happens when you actually uh, put these uh, ideas into practice and actually build systems that I would even say depend upon uh, these icons. Um, uh, I'd like to know, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. So Foodicons began as an accelerator, as I mentioned. Uh, the Lexicon, which is a California-based NGO, has an accelerator program for good ideas that brings together people from all over the world to tackle challenges that are facing food systems. Uh, Green, Brown, Blue uh, is an accelerator that's funded in part by uh, Food at Google. Uh, it's with their direct support that this is uh, possible. The accelerators cover a variety uh, of areas and uh, everything from uh, regenerative agriculture to, to aquaculture. And what the groups immediately found was there was immediate application, even as the design challenge was unfolding, uh, which is still isn't even done, um, they already started to grab them and integrate them. And I'm gonna give you just a couple of very quick examples. Um, the first is a, uh, for the food and packaging space, um, there is uh, one of our accelerators created the first scorecard that actually explains all the chemicals of concern that are in uh, food packaging. And what they really needed was they needed icons to explain that. So when they built their scorecard, which explains what's in food packaging, the icons are, are everywhere. The icons are critical for understanding without the need for further language, what it is you're looking at. And it was a very powerful tool, not only from a design standpoint, but from a literacy standpoint for educating people. One of the things that I find the most interesting about food cons is that people don't realize that it's not an art project. It's a global literacy project. It's how do you create people, uh, how do you give people greater fluency and greater literacy so they can actually understand uh, and embrace um, a food system that's more in line with their values. Because really at the end of the day, the problem that we have is that our food systems are blind. We have no idea who grows our food, where it's grown or how it's grown or how it arrives at our door. That blindness in our supply chains is partially because we don't have the literacy even to know how to ask the questions of what's in our food system. This was a, a core challenge that confronted our other accelerator that wanted to bring more agrobiodiversity into supply chains. So what this group said is, we need to figure out a way to understand from a supplier or a grower what they're doing so we can support those growers who are more in line with our values. Because we have missions as companies that we want to support. We have values as purchasers that we, that we want to see validated through the purchases we make. But how can we do that if we have no idea what's being sourced? So what we did was we created a tool in one of our accelerators that's now open to the public. 
and I'll put the links in afterwards, where you can literally take these 10 principles of agrobiodiversity and audit your own supply chain so you can actually have a better opportunity to support things that are in line with your values. And as you can see, the icons from Foodicons were critical from the very outset. You, you, you select an ingredient, you say where you're based and where you're sourcing from, and then the icons walk you through each of the 10 principles and then you literally use the tool to actually look at every principle and then see what practices are being supported by your, by your purchases. For regenerative agriculture, we were confronted by, again, the same problem. People know what certifications are, organic or this or that, but what's really inside of that definition of organic? In many cases, people just don't know. So what we did was we created really the first place-based model for regenerative agriculture that will ultimately have a standard around it, Regen 1. And then we went to farmers and ranchers and we literally said to them, hey, you know, how can you explain to us what you're doing and how we can support that? And a, a tool, an onboarding tool was built that literally asks producers questions about what they're doing and then turns that into an iconographic system. So we took the foodicons for regenerative agriculture that were created, of which there's over 150, that explains a lot of really, you know, core concepts. And then we said, how can we use all of these icons to actually give you a sense of what's happening on a farm? Not something that just says organic and then we're done. What's really happening in the farm? Because if we can actually educate a consumer or a purchaser on the range of things a regenerative farmer can do, they're going to be a much higher likely that they're going to support them. So as a result of that, you get a producer that suddenly looks like that. This is a digital fingerprint that explains a farmer. This is a farmer that, gone, that went through a process, answered a series of questions that captured what they were doing. And you can now, as a consumer or as a purchaser, actually go over all of these different principles and practices that connect to that producer. And now what you're doing is, you're creating greater literacy with a consumer, greater literacy with a purchaser. You know, a crazy data point, you know, Robin, I'm not sure uh, if this is true, but I'm always told is that the average time that a purchaser spends in a supply chain as a purchaser is two years. So if that's the case, where are they getting the education that can help them to make purchasing decisions that are aligned with their values? or that can support the mission of their company. Sure, they might be able to buy something for the cheapest price. They might be able to buy something just because it's readily available, but how are they really gonna change the food system that is make it more in line with what their values and aspirations are as people, what we all want from a food system, something that mirrors what our values are as individuals. We can't have that if the supply chain's blind. We can't have that if we have no understanding of what, um, of what somebody's trying to do. And we also can't reward them for all the good, all of the ecosystem services that they're providing. This is a starting point. It will be improved upon, obviously. This goes live actually just in a couple of weeks. But what's interesting about this journey that we're now on is we've created a system that is gonna raise global literacy around how food is made so that people can finally support a food system that's in line with their values. And so across the board, whether it's in food packaging, whether it's in agrobiodiversity, whether it's in regenerative agriculture, whether it's in food loss and food waste, we're building a global system, but we're not doing it on our own. This is a starting point. This is the stone in the famous stone soup. What's really gonna make this um, become something that's universally used and accepted uh, is gonna be if people join and build upon it and maintain it and put it into use. I find it amazing that the three examples I gave you came together even before the challenge was done. As Nathan pointed out, the challenge is a few months away from even finishing, but people are already starting to use these icons. And so, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, for designers who are, who have participated to see this, it must be very rewarding to see your work already being used by people all over the world. Challenge isn't even done yet. 
right? Imagine when it's actually officially launched as a set. Imagine what happens when we begin to build on it. Then it's going to be extraordinarily powerful. And so I'm very, you know, Jim, I have to say, uh, Nathan and I are very gratified. And to be honest, uh, super surprised uh, that this has happened so fast. As uh, Nathan and I said, we've only launched this in January of this year. Uh, I also don't want to uh, forget to mention how critical Ellie's been along the way. Uh, it's extraordinary the amount of effort that Ellie's put in. And so many members of the team, but really I have to say, you know, Ellie, you know, we, Nathan and I are, we're, are blessed that you came across this project and uh, put so much energy and effort in it. And you're in all of these icons. So I want to really thank you for that journey that you've taken with us. And Regina too, who's not with us today. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, Jim, um, we're excited. We're excited by where we've gone. Uh, excited to know that we're just at the outset and um, excited to see um, what's gonna come and what um, I think Chloe's gonna speak to next. Yeah, if I yeah. could just follow that up really quickly. Sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Douglas, go ahead. you said something really important and that is, you know, this is just the beginning. And I wanna stress, and, and Maria Luella Tinio had a great question in the Q and A. Um, this is the beginning. We've, we've done a bunch of work to try to make these as good as we can, but the next step is to put them out there in the world and see how they work and where they're not clear and where they work well. And we know that this is gonna be the beginning of an evolutionary process. We expect these icons to evolve over time and get better. That's, that's part of the design process. We've made them as good as we can for now and we're launching them out into the world. But we know that over time, they'll probably turn into you know, color, they'll be more detailed, they'll look more and more like emoticons and we welcome that. Uh, but there's only so much, you know, our food experts and our design council can anticipate uh, for a system that's going to be used literally all over the world and, and reflect so many people's uh, cultures and understandings and backgrounds. So this, I just wanted to stress that this is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, Nathan, um, Ellie, Viksha. All of these coming together is, is so exciting. As someone who came who, who had who spent some time teaching in university I think those icons can encapsulate certain concepts just quickly for students to to see and also communicate and then you know in the NGO space in the development space we can also communicate lots of you know advocacies concepts designs and just quickly in a snapshot of an icon and of course definitely raise awareness and the cons and consumer education uh, on, on how food is being produced. It's really, really exciting. So now, I mean, we've gone through the food systems concepts going behind these, the design process, the use of these icons. And now we're going to look at how do we continue forward with that? And I know if you look at the trend of different movements, it's always been around communities you know, building a community around it. And I feel like this is something where we're going towards. And so let me call on Chloe, right, to, to go and explain how a community, how we're building that community around this. So I'm handing it over to you, Chloe. You have the floor. Thank you, Jim. Um, so yeah, so since Foodicons is the shared global language, our goal is that everyone here will have a chance to contribute to it and add to it so everyone is able to use it as best as they can. So as we move forward with this partnership between the World Food Forum and Foodicons, we'd like to make an open call to invite members of the World Food Forum to join. So first, um, we have an online community where everyone can post articles and collaborate with each other and just discuss these ideas that are all floating around and we all have the shared cause. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, more specifically for Foodicons, we have a number of ways that people can get involved. And I will also share a link to a Google form where you can share contact information with us and also let us know how you'd be interested in joining and um, working with Foodicons. So a few things that we have is um, we will need an executive committee for Foodicons. So you'll provide oversight to make sure things are moving forward. And um, each year we're planning on adding new terms. So you'll kind of be helping organize that design process that we uh, that Nathan and Douglas and Ellie have had such a huge role in so far. Also, we're making a call for food system, 
food systems experts to suggest needs for new icons and to explain to help explain these concepts and terms and provide expert feedback on the designs throughout the review process since as you saw earlier it's an iterative process so making sure we get that feedback step by step also um, we're obviously looking for more designers to join our designer collective and to join the team of designers creating new foodicons. And finally, NGOs, government agencies, startups, and food companies to continue creating partnerships to showcase ways that foodicons can be used for marketing and packaging, like some of the ways that Douglas shared earlier. And so again, to drop a link to a Google form in the chat, and then it looks like Douglas just put in a link for the online community. So we welcome everyone to join, to get involved, and we would love to collaborate with you all. And I'll send it back over to you, Jim. Thanks, thanks, Chloe. And uh, this is really exciting. You know, in fact, when Douglas and Alberto uh, promoted the launch yesterday during the food, uh, the Youth Action Assembly, I went on ahead onto the Google form. Even if I was moderating this, I was like, I'm going to jump in on that Google form already. Put, I, put, I put my name already in there. So go ahead. For those listening in, go into that link and join the, the, the community because this is something that we're all going to be sharing and we're all going to be benefiting from. And I think it's something that's really crucial for all of us that, that the food systems becomes more transparent. It becomes us and it becomes like a manifestation of who we are who our cultures are and the the kind of food that we produce and we consume it, this is really really exciting and so um i'm gonna ask douglas or nathan if you have anything else to add to that um or anything last uh messages you want to share with everybody here yeah, I'll let Douglas have the last word, but uh, I, I just okay. wanted to reiterate that this is an ongoing process. You know, we uh, when when the collection, you can go to download all of the icons to date uh, from the Foodicons website. In another week or so, you'll be able to go to the Noun Project and see and see and download most of them. We've we've covered in depth just a fraction of the categories that we know are going to be needed and we're working on the rest. So we have a good set of icons for climate change and farming and regenerative agriculture and agrobiodiversity, soil and nutrition, um, even alternative proteins right now. But we are hard at work right now with a huge set for aquaculture, food loss, food waste, packaging, and, and maybe most importantly, or, or one of the most importantly, supply chain, supply cycle, because we have built this system and it may not be clear, but we have built this systems first for uh, the people who work in the food systems, not for consumers. Um, many people see the allergens and the diet icons, et cetera, and think consumer uses. And by all means, we expect these to show up in front of uh, eaters, but really what we're trying to do is create a language for people in the industries around food to better communicate with each other. And so we have, we have a good long list of categories and icons and terms that we're still working on. So by all means, if you see um, holes, uh, icons that are missing, terms that are missing for your work, please get in touch. Um, perhaps they're already in development, but very likely, they may not be and we would you know we're here to serve those you know those actors in the food system so we need input into what you need to do your work thanks thanks uh that's a, that's really exciting thanks nathan douglas over to you well you know uh i think uh the reason why we're really excited with the opportunity to collaborate with the World Food Forum is that we're creating a universal language and the custodians of that language, uh, the people that put it into use, that activate it, um, are gonna be the members of your community. And so what we're doing, Jim, as, as Chloe, I think really clearly articulated, is we're inviting you to join with us to form four, four, four core areas, an executive committee of governance. How do we manage this, this language? The importance of 
of of building that out and controlling how it's used and 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 leading to its greater dissemination. How do we bring designers from all over the world together um, to continue to add to it? How do we bring food system experts in to help decide what areas and what core and, and what core thematic buckets needed and like need to be added? Because you know it's crazy, Jim. We added a hundred and something terms for aquaculture. Not enough, not enough, but enough to get started, right? Uh, that's why we're so excited to bring this to this group, right? Regenerative agriculture, I don't know, Nathan, 125 terms? Turns out not enough, right? Oh yeah, no, we're over 150 for sure, yeah. Yeah, so people are gonna continue to add to this, this language, right? And then there's gonna be, be the need to translate it into different languages as well. So there's a tremendous opportunity here, you know, um, the analogy I, I like to use, Jim, is that the Oxford English Dictionary puts out their word of the year every year and everybody, you know, writes about it. Um, the World Food Forum can start putting out the Foodicon term of the year and the icon of the year. And journalists were right about that. You know, these are the types of things that we really think are, will, will be a very powerful asset for your community, a tool, a uniting initiative for your community that you'll be able to build upon. And what Nathan and I and, you know, and Chloe and Ellie and our team are really excited to do is collaborate with you on building that out and taking it uh, to the next level. So that's the exciting thing for us. And that's why we're so happy to be here today. Wow. Amazing. This has been an absolute adrenaline rush for people who are wanting to communicate about their passion in food systems and agriculture and food systems, aquaculture, marine resources and natural resources. I think this is just the way forward. And it's just, we've only scratched the surface. This is basically just tip of the iceberg, really. I mean, looking at the details of like production systems going to, you know, soil conservation, electroconductivity, pH, relative humidity, all of these things coming together. These are elements that could be well explained by an icon, you know, and 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 definitely something that we need to uh, embrace across food systems, across cultures. And it's really exciting to see that as someone who is an art enthusiast to some point, to some degree, you know, I do digital sketching. When I saw this, I was just excited really to see that there was this kind of initiative. So for those who are listening in, like, this is something you really have to tune in. This is something you, you don't want to miss. This is something you don't want to let go of and just listen to. This is a community you could be part of. And so going back again to that Google form that Chloe just shared, um, make sure to go in, uh, put your name in there, select a group you want to be part of, be part of the community, really encourage you to go in and that. And this is something that all of us can really benefit from and all of us can put in something together. So with that, this is, has been an exciting launch, really. And, you know, I know Maximo is here, Mateo is here from the World Food Farm. We're really excited to see how this can also move forward with, with, those suggest, with that suggestion quickly of uh, Douglas, you know, something that could be embraced by young people, by the Youth Action Assembly. Absolutely, something can be done. And this is just the beginning of a beautiful journey, as Mateo always says in the other sessions. So again, thank you for joining this, this conversation, this launch. And this is not the end. This is just the beginning. So go ahead, sign up in that form, go to that community, be part of it, and let's work together to build this universal visual language. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, Nathan, Robin, Romano, Ellie, Chloe, Maximo, and Mateo for the support. And of course, Viksha and the rest of the designers. Absolutely great work. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Bye-bye. What an amazing session. Yep. <laughs> All right, bye.
Is anyone from the audiovisual services connected? Just one moment, please. Yes, okay. Starting. <laughs> Okay, uh, do you have a, a microphone, my team? Maybe the sound is, yes. could be better with a microphone if you have it. Uh, are you saying with or without be better? Um, uh, I think with a, a microphone. I'm using yes. it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using it. So is it okay? Ah, okay, okay. I take it okay. Yes, I think we should start then, uh, my team, when you... Okay, great. So, um, yeah, welcome to all. I am my team, you mourn an Indigenous Peoples uh, UN Food Systems Summit uh, champion from Myanmar, uh, an Indigenous youth, myself. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be moderating today's special session. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this World Food Forum session entitled Indigenous Youth Contribution to Food Systems Transformation. Before we start, I would like to share a few housekeeping rules. My colleagues will copy paste these rules in the chat too. Uh, we encourage speakers to edit your Zoom name to include in this order, organization or indigenous people, and then your name. This event will have interpretation available in English, French, Russian, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese. We will have the honor to have Yana Tanagasheva performing a spiritual ceremony. During the brainstorming session, for questions to the panel panelists, uh, we encourage you to use the chat and please write question before writing it. And if it's a comment, you can write comment before uh, your sentence. And please be specific, concise, and direct the question towards the person you wish to ask. I think that we are all set now to start our discussion. So uh, we have the honor to receive the blessings of Yana Tanagasheva, representative of the Shore Indigenous people. Yana, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, my team. Dear all, dear Indigenous brothers and sisters, I'm honored to host this spiritual opening ceremony today. As I said in the preview ceremony last week, each of us is the seed. Children, years are growing. What we all saw today, it will germinate tomorrow and we will pass it on to our descendants. Let our spirits help us. I wish you all health, prosperity and fill your soul with the power of positive energy and spiritual harmony. Already, 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 already
Thank you. Thank you very much, Iana. With no further ado, I would like to move the opening remarks and I would like to invite Iwan Mins, who is an indigenous child who belongs to indigenous community of Oran located in central part of India. Iwan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Johar everyone. Johar everyone. I extend my thanks to the organizers who have provided me this platform to express my thoughts. Hi, I am Ivan Abemins, an indigenous boy from the land of forest Charkat, located in the central part of India. I offer my prayers to the ancestors and Lord Almighty. I call upon my traditional faith to bless the deceased whom we lost during pandemic. Johar, Johar, Johar. A couple of days ago, the publication Indigenous People's Food System received the Best 2021 Sustainability Report Award from Halbars and the Alfred Noble House. It is indeed a matter of great pride for the Indigenous communities across the globe. This is an important achievement. This kind of recognition adds on the voice of indigenous peoples who have their own unique food system. Second, it will draw the attention of other relevant stakeholders who will now look at the indigenous food system with an entire new outlook. I have been strongly advocating for the preservation and promotion of indigenous food system and indigenous knowledge system. The more I have been interacting with my community elders, I discover more and more about the rich indigenous food system. Indigenous traditional farming methods are highly dependent, rich in nutrients, have high medic medicinal values and a resistance to adverse weather conditions. In many of our Adivasi communities in India, we practice multi-crop farming. This ensures survival of either of the crop that will keep the community alive. Second, the multi-crop are such designed that it keeps the soil content rich. On contrary, Pacific focus on ca the cash crop production largely compromises with the health of Mother Earth. Indigenous elders consider us as their hope. We are honored to have gained their belief in us. The indigenous youths are well aware with the recent technological advancement and the traditional indigenous knowledge, both. This can be put to best practices. There are avenues in indigenous food system that are unexplored. Somewhere, it is exploited. While at the places, we have witnessed uncontrolled extraction. My grandmother M. Bakla, in one of her bedtime stories, once told how a lion used to annoy all the wildlife in jungle, fed up with the everyday harassment. The flock, flock of sheep came together and they discussed in length. They failed to find a solution. Later, Someone advised that it would be great if a joint meeting is called of all the animals. And it worked. The story seems incomplete, but the message is clear. An inclusive growth is impossible without the participation of all. Hence, involving non-indigenous youths across the globe is call of the R. A mutual exchange of ideas, discussion, sharing, and learning of good practices will any day broaden the room of knowledge of indigenous youths. Knowledge has no boundaries. Let it flow freely from one community to other, from country to another, and from one continent to other. 
let's join hands for global peace and defeat hunger and poverty in almost all of the moral stories of every community we know that unity provides strength so it's high time that we all come together as this earth belongs to all be the indigenous or non indigenous we the coming generation will breathe the same air eat the same food witness the same climate change let's have a mutual respect and understanding of one another and grow together no one to be left behind under the guidance of my indigenous community elders i look forward to hold hands with the non indigenous and indigenous youth across the world and be a part of movement where the indigenous food system and indigenous rights are gracefully respected thank you for your kind attention johar johar i want thank you very much for your insightful words and you have really highlighted the role of indigenous youths not only the role of indigenous youths but also the importance of working together as a generation worldwide thank you very much next i would like now to invite his excellency miguel garcia winder mexico ambassador to the rome based agencies to take the floor my team thank you so much for this uh, introduction um uh, it, it is a, a really a great honor for me and a great pleasure to be here with you and have this opportunity to share some views but especially to share the space with such a qualified group of young and not so young professionals uh, many of whom I have personally admired uh, thank you so much as as you know uh, in rome we have a group of friends that is called the group of friends of indigenous peoples and i had the i have the privilege to be part of this group uh, and work for you and work uh, with you in june 16 i had the opportunity to address the indigenous youth forum and uh, in that intervention i highlighted the crucial role that youth can have in the transformation not only of the food system but truly the transformation of the world i still believe that youth uh, are the truly game changers uh, many of us that are old are accustomed to the old ways are afraid to take risk and normally we express the world we can't uh, but you guys you that are young that are uh, game changers that are willing to take the risk are truly the ones who are going to change this we we have a lot of challenges and i think you have more challenges than we do because we are going in our way out but uh, let me start by saying that history is not fair and uh, many times we spend long days and nights thinking about the past my first message is to try to buy the young uh, today to look at the future we have the choice either we spend our times complaining about the past or we put the blocks to create the future and i believe that you are uh, in the right direction of putting the blocks to create the future we can think of a dark future or we can think of a bright future and the fact that we are all here trying to discuss the transformation of food system it is a uh, hope for a bright future i think you as a young uh, indigenous people have many challenges one is to rescue your history your values and the traditions of our uh, ancestors your ancestors particularly but also you have the challenge to get involved in the science and the new technologies and innovation and be the frontier of knowledge and and i think this is a, a challenge that uh, need to be seriously undertaken uh, you cannot do this in isolation i think you need to work together as uh, i want you said we need to work all across all the races across all the groups indigenous non indigenous rural non rural urban non urban uh, as you know uh, we just finished the food system uh, summit and in the food system summit uh, with the help uh, and with the leadership of indigenous people we made a proposal for a coalition 
a coalition that, rec that want to recognize and protect the indigenous food systems. We believe that the indigenous food systems have some particular elements and some unique elements that would allow other food systems to learn and to become more sustainable. So this coalition is a coalition that really embraced these two, these two points. The point of recognizing and protecting the, the, the indigenous food systems, but also recognizing that there are elements that we can take from these systems and export for using a word to other systems. I believe this is a challenge that we need the youth to help us to do that. Because you understand the value of the old, but you also comprehend the uh, opportunities of, of the future. And I just want to finish, because we have very few minutes, with a message of unity. I really believe that we live in a world that is totally polarized, polarized. In a, in a world that sometimes had so much negative views. You know, uh, we get up in the mornings and we talk about wars, famine, disaster, climate change. But I want to finish with a message of hope because I really believe that the young, the future generations, you uh, are the ones who can create a better world. The future of our world is in your hands. We, uh, as part of the group of friends in Rome, just want to reiterate our uh, commitment to try to find better ways and to try to find ways to support your uh, transit in this uh, complex period or, or this complex scenario that we, we call life. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Iwa, for your message of unity. I think that's a message that we need to resonate across this forum. You can create the unity across all people, across all colors, across all genders. Thank you so much, my guy, for, um, for um, your opportunity and reiterate my friendship to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, um, for the opening remarks. And I would like to take this opportunity to really thank you for standing strongly with us uh, throughout the food systems process standing for uh, the rights of indigenous peoples and indigenous people's food systems, and also for your support for the coalition of uh, indigenous people's food systems. We truly appreciate and we are very much looking forward to your continued support to the food systems of indigenous peoples and in the youths. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh -huh. Now, I would like to give the floor to our Jon Fernandez de la Rinoa, head of FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. Jon, the floor is yours. Well, uh, dear my team, uh, is it what an honor to be with you? And I want to start by uh, by thanking uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Miguel Garcia for those words. But also I want. I think there's so much wisdom already that. Uh, I will try to, to speak from my side to see whether I can uh, support and complement the, the, the global efforts that we are all putting together. Um, excellencies, uh, indigenous youth, distinguished panelists, colleagues, uh, as has been said, indigenous youth are game changers and they are key allies in achieving food security for all. They're guardians of traditional knowledge. And when they combine this knowledge with new information and technologies, they do play a key role in innovation and in advancing their communities' well-being. We saw indigenous youth across the world stepping up during the COVID-19 pandemic, protecting their elders, sharing information, networking, and coming up with measures that blended their ancestral knowledge with new technologies. They basically stepped up to protect their communities and in many cases, reach and support areas where the state very often couldn't reach. I think they taught us all a great lessons. While they have shown the world their capacity, it is true that climate change displacement, pressures from external actors, loss of land, and lack of access to education services have compounded the effects of COVID-19 and affect them significantly. This has resulted in more indigenous youth migrating to urban areas, resulting in the disruption of indigenous people's food systems, the hampering on the transmission of indigenous language, and in difficulties in the continuation of culture and cosmogony that affects traditional knowledge. The Wipala paper on indigenous people's food systems by the Global Hub and the Pau publications on indigenous people's food systems, they both reveal 
an alarming decline in the transmission of indigenous people's traditional knowledge and a threat to the continuation of indigenous people's food systems. Losing indigenous languages means losing knowledge and food systems. This will be an irreversible loss of biocultural diversity for the world that will compromise the biodiversity conservation that is happening in indigenous people's territories at planetary level. Evidence shows that we urgently need intercultural education and dedicated mechanisms to strengthen the continuity of indigenous people's traditional knowledge and languages before it's too late. Evidence shows that indigenous youth are fundamental in this process as today's youth and tomorrow's leaders. FAO is aware of the many challenges faced by indigenous peoples and specifically indigenous youth. FAO is also aware of how critical their participation is to develop strategies and policies to eradicate hunger and to make global food systems sustainable and resilient. This is why the work on indigenous people's food systems started in FAO already in 2009. Since 2014, the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit has been responsible for implementing the FAO policy on indigenous peoples, including indigenous youth in the seven pillars of work, but more important in one of their main focus areas. In 2016, indigenous youth presented in UN New York a report with data about their prevalence of suicide and self-inflicted harm. Their lack of hope and the pressures over their livelihoods and territories force them into situations of despair that result tragically. FAO moved by this data, calling 2017 a meeting in Rome to convey the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus to meet with the Director General, with senior management, and to discuss how our organization could support the indigenous youth. Resulting from this meeting, indigenous youth suggested a new pillar of work on traditional knowledge and climate change that was incorporated in them. And they requested an internship program dedicated to indigenous youth that was addressed by FAO and is still today running. The Rome Declaration on Indigenous Youth, released then, became a cornerstone for indigenous youth and FAO's work together, but looking into the future. And one of their requests then was to have a dedicated indigenous youth forum hosted in FAO. The UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues picked up on this request and officially recommended FAO to host this forum. And let me tell you that only after plenty of work, indigenous youth and FAO co-organized in June this year, 2021, the first indigenous youth forum. Our thanks to the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and to the indigenous champions of the UN Food System Summit for making this forum possible. Special thanks to you, my team, because you were a key player in making this forum a reality. The forum's endorsement of the Indigenous Youth Global Declaration of Sustainable and Resilient Food Systems spoke loud and put forward three requests to member states, civil society, private sector, and academia. First, to recognize indigenous people's food systems as game-changing solution for the world that must be preserved and respected. Second, to create intercultural education programs. Third, to create a fund for indigenous peoples that supports youth-led innovation initiatives, combining technology with traditional knowledge. In this regard, FAO and the Global Hub are committed to continuing working hand-in-hand -hand with indigenous youth to ensure their full participation in policy decision-making processes. The recently created Indigenous People's Food Systems Coalition is a unique opportunity for Indigenous youth to participate in policymaking. Our thanks to Mexico and to Ambassador uh, Miguel Garcia Winder for his leadership in forging this Indigenous People's Food Systems Coalition. And our thanks as well to New Zealand and the other five countries that are supporting this coalition. In closing, two points. FPO remains ready to support the success of this coalition on Indigenous People's Food Systems. And FAO's commitment is reflected in the ongoing discussion to include in the programmatic priority areas indigenous peoples across the phobies, better production, nutrition, environment, and better lives. Thank you for your attention and over to you, my team. Thank you very much, Yon. You really remind uh, me of the, all the work that we've been doing together as indigenous youths and uh, together with uh, FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. And thank you for your leadership always and for creating space for Indigenous youths, consulting us and in you know, always very respectful manner. Thank you always for listening to us and for the great work that you've been doing uh, so far. Um, and also, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you and your team for making this event 
possible, especially this session entitled to Indigenous Youth's Contribution to the Food Systems Transformation. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we would like to move uh, to the next uh, round of uh, session, the, our very first session of uh, discussions. So we will listen to three Indigenous leaders in their respective fields who have been working strongly on Indigenous people's food systems. We are going to listen uh, from Ms. Tanya Eulalia Martinez-Cruz, who is an Uyuk Indigenous woman from Mexico, member of the Global Hub on Indigenous Food Systems, postdoctoral research fellow in anthropology at the University of Greenwich. And then we would move to uh, another session on introduction to indigenous people's foods from chefs. Uh, we will listen from uh, Maria Gladstone. Uh, she is a Blackfeet, Cherokee and founder of Indigi Kitchen in the USA, focusing on revitalizing native foods of the Americas through digital media and videos. And next, we will hear from Justin Piok. Uh, he is an Ashihi Dini who is born in the Bitani people, indigenous chef and owner of the Piokki Food Group USA. Unfortunately, he could not be with us today, but he sent us a video message. So we will listen to all these uh, three great uh, indigenous leaders. And first, I would like to invite Ms. Tanya Yulalia Martinez-Cruz to talk to us about the characteristics of indigenous people's food systems. Ms. Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I'm also uh, happy to be in this session that uh, highlights the key role of youth in relation to indigenous food systems and indigenous knowledge. So to answer the question a, of what characterizes indigenous people's food systems, I will also make a reference to the white paper that Dion has mentioned before a, of the, that was written a, by 60 actors or with contributions of 60 actors around the world a, coming from six different regions, um, which actually I'm gonna just a, place here in the chat in case any of you is interested um, in reading it, if you haven't done that yet. Um, so uh, we usually are asked, why should we care about indigenous people's food systems? Why should we care about indigenous knowledge? What are the key features? So um, I think the first characteristic that I would like to highlight is the multifunctionality and the holistic uh, nature of indigenous people's food systems. And what do I mean by that? Well, the natural environment, it's not separated a from people, from where uh, in nature, people get food, medicine, shelter, energy. And it also uh, plays a key role in the identity, culture, social, and spiritual life of indigenous peoples. It's quite common, for example, that my people, before we are going to start the cropping season and planting maize within this meal traditional system, that we pour some mezcal to the mother earth because we want to ask Mother Earth for a fruitful harvest at the end of this, the cycle. Also, for example, the Zapotecan peoples in a Oaxaca, Mexico, a, perform many rituals, a, thinking of the river and forest as something interlinked with life. Water is life, so therefore we need to take care of the forest if we want to keep water. Um, so, a, also with COVID, what I learned, for example, is the Awahun people, because of all the limitations of infrastructure, they use a lot of traditional plants or traditional medicine to overcome part of the disease and be resistant in fighting COVID-19. So in the end, what I want to say is like nature and all the forms of life are connected for indigenous peoples. And this is a unique feature of indigenous people's food system. Secondly, indigenous people's food systems are both about generation and food production. As or dear I one mentioned in the beginning, I think modern food systems are usually focusing on monocropping, whereas 
uh, for indigenous peoples, we have a different management of the territories and lands. And that's what has kept our people resilient for centuries. We have adapted receipts to a specific environments, to our living patterns, and our practices have kept us alive um, through centuries because we learned to adapt uh, to, our, to our environment. So another thing is like indigenous peoples, a indigenous people's innovations do not deplete natural resources or increase carbon emissions. On the contrary, they have a different management that is low in carbon emission. We also use many ways or sources of renewable energy within our territory. And this is why we also tend or our people tends to have a different management because depleting the resources means we would be depleting the, 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 the sources that keep us alive and provide basic inputs for our ways of living. It's quite common, for example, and I love these narratives when I talk to a, my brothers and sisters from different regions, how they say, we need to protect our rivers, we need to protect our forests because they are the source of our life. And if we want to continue enjoying the virtues of nature, we need to preserve it. Another thing, it's linked to the respect for the ecosystem that leads also respecting the seasonality and natural cycles of the ecosystems. For example, in my region, yes, we rely on agriculture, but also gathering. A, many of these practices um, have allowed that indigenous peoples preserve the 80% of the biodiversity in less than the 25% of the lands in the earth. So some other examples I can give you is a, that people, when you have harvest all the crops in some fields, it might seem that there's no food left, but people actually can go and use some of the roots that are available in those a, fields and still you have access to food. But that's a knowledge that sometimes modern science neglects because they do not have a clear understanding on how people it's managing the complexity of these systems. Or another example is how the Tohono people in the Arizona desert, in the driest season of the year, when you would believe there's nothing in the desert, they can harvest the saguaro fruits and leave from the sugar they can a, get from these fruits. Um, another example, it's also the Inuit people. Sometimes the researchers or modern science has asked how is that these people can survive only eating fish? And one of the secrets is like the richness of the diets. It's not only on the foods, but also the different combinations on how you cook it and prepare it. And that's only a knowledge embedded a, in indigenous populations. And that's something again, that we many times tend to neglect as scientists and researchers. So a, indigenous people's food systems are highly self-sufficient and nutrition, nutritious, as I mentioned. Um, another example I also love providing is a, in terms of Mesoamerica, when maize was, ta was taken to Africa, people expected that maize would have the same effect in, in, a, in terms of food a provision for the African population. But what happened was like the, one of the secrets of the maize in Mexico and Mesoamerica was that 1600 different ways of cooking it, which also was embedded in the culture and identity of indigenous populations. So again, why is it important and crucial to preserve indigenous people's food systems? Because all the knowledge that it's embedded on it. If we want to protect, just to finalize a, this indigenous food systems, we also need to acknowledge that they are embedded within a territory that they are embedded in a value system and a governance system. And therefore we need to ensure that indigenous peoples can preserve or enact the right to self-determination, but also the right to their territories. Linking this to youth, what is that the youth has to contribute? I think John said it rightly, how with COVID we learn that youth are not passive actors, we are active. And um, we say that every two weeks a language is dying. When a language dies, it also, a lot of this knowledge is dying. So we need to come up with intercultural policies that allow that the youth also plays a crucial role when these decisions are made and that they come up front in protecting not only the knowledge of our people and the resilience of indigenous peoples, but for the planet, just because, as I said, or we have said many times, 
indigenous peoples are the keepers of a great number of the biodiversity of this planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Tanya. Uh, thank you so much for the all the important My team, we can hear you. Maybe we can we can all um, close our videos. So maybe the the audio is going to be better. We can give the floor to Maria Glaston. Uh, colleagues, allow me to allow me to step in while we recover the connection for my team. As you know, my team is uh, speaking from Myanmar, so sometimes the the connectivity is an issue. So um, I would like to, to call upon the, the next speaker, upon Maria. Uh, please, Maria, are you with us? Maria Glaston, kindly take the floor. Hi, Hello. Maria, welcome. Over to you. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Maria Gladstone. Um, I am Blackfeet and Cherokee. Um, I live in the northwest corner of Montana uh, in the United States, close to the Canadian border. And uh, I run an online teaching tool called Indigikitchen, which is dedicated to telling the story of indigenous foods through digital media and using it as a platform to expand indigenous knowledge and the revitalization of our food systems. Um, the previous speaker spoke so eloquently about the traditional ecological knowledge and the ways in which indigenous people use generations of place-based, time-tested, knowledge and understanding of our spaces to develop our food systems. And connecting with that information, recognizing sustainability that has been practiced for thousands of years, recognizing the ways in which we can find food, whether it is through the foods that we can grow or through the fo foods that grow naturally in our spaces around us, uh, and the systems that teach us how to harvest, how to preserve those foods, how to recognize where we can have a role in the land management of those spaces, not just to ensure that our people are well fed, but also that these places that we are from are maintained. So for example, uh, the Blackfeet people are on the border between the mountains and the prairies. We're lucky to have access to both the ecosystems very easily. And through our place on this land for the past 14,000 plus years, uh, we've also practiced traditional burning. 
um, we have burnt off parts of the prairie at relatively low temperatures in the spring or the fall to help cleanse the prairies of that old dried grass, but to help uh, concentrate heat in those areas and to encourage new grass to come up in the springtime, which helps, so of course, attract animals that graze on it that we can use for food. But beyond that, this low temperature burning also helps with the revitalization of certain plant species. So one of our foods, it's a root vegetable, the prairie turnip actually has this very, very thick seed coat. And it requires some type of uh, scarification, some type of breaking of the seed coat to help those seeds germinate. And that can happen through several freeze thaw cycles, or it can happen through prairie fires. And so our practices of burning not only help us with our grazing and our land management and the maintenance of our prairies, uh, rather than them turning into shrubland, but they also help these root vegetables germinate and grow generation after generation. So we see in the absence of these fires, uh, the population of some of our food plants has declined as well. So it is not just us that rely on our food, but it is also our ecosystems that rely on us. Um, so I'll leave it at that and pass it to the next speaker. Thank you, Maria, for those words and uh, so much knowledge about the about the food systems in the prairies from your part of the world. Um, my team, I, I saw you were connected back. Uh, how is your connection? Uh, should I pass you the, the floor or, or should we play the video uh, that comes next and then uh, pass you the floor so we can sort out your um, IT issues? So let us play the video. And then with the video, we will conclude this first block about uh, indigenous people's food systems and their characterization. So we are going to watch a video by Justin Pioch, an indigenous chef and owner of the Pioch Food Group in the USA. Yeah, it's eh, Justin Pioch in the chef. I see him 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 in the chef. My name is Justin Pioch. I'm a Salt Clan Navajo born for the Folded Arms people. And I believe that our youth can contribute to a more sustainable and resilient food system by actually doing that, contributing your time. Don't just shout indigenous this and that. I'll try to be indigenous. Learn about your history. Go and help your elders if they need help with anything. If they have a farm, good, go and learn how to do that. If not, plant a garden. I mean, learn about our history. Nothing changes, then nothing will change. We need to all get together, and I know that you can do it. Thank you so much, uh, Chef Yotche, for those words and for so much enlightenment about the way forward and for the, the message of, the, of wisdom and of action, which is what we need today. So let us move to the next block. Um, we are still waiting for my team to reconnect. I hope they can be sorted meanwhile, so allow me to carry on. And we have two unique uh, speakers that are going to talk about the way forward and that are also going to present challenges, commitments, and insights from the Indigenous Youth Global Declaration on Sustainable and Resilient Food Systems. We are going to be talking about what are the challenges, but also what can be done. And who best to talk about this than Jessica Vega Ortega, the co-chair of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus in Mexico and one of the UN Food Systems Champions, uh, and Anish Shresta, the Security Director of the Youth for Environment, Education and Development Foundation in Nepal. Jessica, the floor is yours. Jessica, over to you, please. Anish, if you are connected, can I pass you the floor, please? Or I see Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Over to you, please.
Dubadi Quindo está y es na y buenos días, buenas tardes a todas y todos hermanos. Agradezco la palabra el día de hoy. Es para mí eh, un honor poder decir que hemos llegado hasta este momento en un proceso de reflexión hacia el tema que anteriormente habían compartido con ustedes, de un proceso largo sobre poner en las agendas internacionales el tema de la alimentación, el derecho a la alimentación, de los sistemas alimentarios indígenas como una prioridad para el mundo. En este sentido, hablo de hablar del tema de la alimentación como un eje transversal sobre el tema de los derechos. Temas como lo mencionaba hace rato eh, John Fernández, que ha apuntalado muy bien sobre cómo la innovación y la combinación de los conocimientos tradicionales pueden impactar de una manera positiva y tener bienes colaterales uno del otro. Sin embargo, para poder asegurar este futuro en donde las juventudes indígenas estén presentes en una participación plena y efectiva, también tiene que ver con hablar de políticas que garanticen los derechos básicos de las juventudes. Y hablo, por ejemplo, como el tema de la educación, en donde difícilmente los jóvenes indígenas alcanzan un grado de profesionalización o el grado más alto de la educación occidental. Y esto genera eh, muchas veces seguir viviendo en barreras umbrales eh, de desigualdad y de eh, desequidad. En este sentido, hablo de que es necesario también trabajar hacia otras políticas transversales que puedan impactar en el conocimiento de rescatar y valorizar las enseñanzas colectivas de nuestros pueblos. Combinar los pensamientos con la ciencia puede ser fundamental para el futuro y las futuras generaciones. Sin embargo, estas barreras, como he señalado, siguen siendo parte del vivir diario de los jóvenes indígenas. Los jóvenes indígenas aún tenemos barreras de acceso a las tecnologías y estamos en un mundo que nos está desafiando constantemente para tener este acceso y ser garante de las voces y ser garante de la participación plena. Como jóvenes hemos logrado acceder a estos espacios en donde las agendas nos permiten visibilizar nuestras preocupaciones y tenemos muchas preocupaciones, pero también tenemos la inquietud de seguir aportando. Hemos visto algunas prácticas, se han presentado algunas prácticas de innovación. Sin embargo, estos jóvenes han tenido que derrumbar esas barreras de las que hablo. Y seguimos viendo todavía algunas preocupaciones, sobre todo en el tema de la apropiación de los sistemas alimentarios. Debemos señalar nuestro patrimonio gastronómico en el sentido de poder proteger nuestro patrimonio de los sistemas alimentarios. No nos gustaría ver cómo la innovación la tienen en las manos las grandes comercializadoras. Nos gustaría que los jóvenes sean los que puedan innovar y poner el patrimonio gastronómico en un nivel alto. Por eso es importante seguir apoyando las capacidades técnicas y es momento de agradecer todo el esfuerzo que se ha venido haciendo para que la coalición que ha permitido formarse en este espacio del marco de la Cumbre Mundial de la Alimentación, en donde siete países han respaldado la iniciativa indígena, puede ser un paso fundamental e histórico en el sentido de poder garantizar los financiamientos específicos para los pueblos indígenas y que este actuar permita a niveles nacionales y locales impactar de una manera positiva, porque sin la alimentación los jóvenes indígenas no podrían tampoco desarrollar sus capacidades, tampoco la niñez o la adolescencia podría pensar en continuar con la preservación de la biodiversidad. Es fundamental garantizar la 
política nacional, no solamente la política global, y con ello respaldar las iniciativas de las juventudes. Agradezco la oportunidad y el espacio, pero sobre todo el gran esfuerzo que las juventudes hacen al romper todas estas barreras estructurales y continuar con el compromiso de nuestras abuelas y nuestros abuelos que nos han heredado su voluntad para poder continuar en la preservación de la madre tierra y con esto también de nuestros sistemas alimentarios. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ti, Jessica. And thank you for mentioning the abuelas, the, the, grand, the grandmothers and the grandfathers, the, uh, the, and to honor our ancestors. So from the lands of Oaxaca, let us move to the sacredness of the Himalayas. Anish, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, Jon. Uh, I hope uh, you all are hearing me. Um, first of all, uh, I convey my warm greetings uh, from the uh, land of Mount Everest, uh, <laughs> as said by Jon, uh, exactly by the Himalayas. We call it Hindu Kush Himalaya region, uh, where we are based, and uh, it's an indefinite uh, uh, point of time or history. We are uh, right here at the moment when we are speaking about like the climate crisis is just beyond our corner and then uh, the food system uh, has also been uh, broken up. So I think we are almost at the wars of the extinction of our planet and it is our responsibility to, uh, um, to uh, have the common effort from all, the, all of the uh, human uh, population uh, towards resilient uh, and uh, the indigenous youth has been uh, as uh, one of the flag barriers uh, on safeguarding, protecting the uh, natural resources and also uh, the traditional uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, which also includes the uh, traditional food uh, mechanism uh, system and the uh, food security uh, tools of the indigenous peoples who are practicing it from uh, decades and uh, from uh, ancient history, uh, which has been a cruel for the human population on um, nourishing themselves and also to with the support of that to continue uh, the uh, generation. I think uh, I know indigenous people uh, are the one bringing all to uh, attention or to the introduction to the uh, entire human population, uh, the food and other natural resources uh, that uh, you know, uh, peoples have started and is consuming in the best, uh, in the interest of uh, to continue the life and and also to uh, continue the economy. Uh, but uh, as we know, uh, we are almost uh, not in a sustainable path of uh, that. So indigenous youth have been struggling on showing a right direction. And I think uh, on that uh, indigenous people or youth have been um, struggling or you know, challenging and also uh, doing some innovative initiatives on protecting and preserving the traditional indigenous knowledge, which has been very critical on how we uh, transform the present uh, scenario to more uh, sustainable and just and resilient uh, world. Uh, so I think uh, as the indigenous youth, uh, we need to do a lot. Uh, but as we know, um, you know, not only talking about the, the innovations or the best of work uh, we are doing, uh, but we also have a lot of resource consistence and other uh, problems uh, be, uh, you know, behind us. Also, one of the key challenges I would mention would be the uh, would be the uh, recognition of the indigenous youth or the indigenous people themselves as one of the key component of the, and also one of the uh, um, safeguard or the guards of the planet. Uh, so and uh, this has been already a tough uh, situation uh, for us. Uh, you know uh, um, that we could not have this, uh, and then the a lot of other problems are coming on way as I mentioned, climate crisis, and uh, we are also in the track of uh, achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. So it is important uh, for the indigenous peoples and also the indigenous youth themselves to be provided with the spaces and platforms where we can speak, where we can represent, and where we can participate uh, on the not only on debating on what is best for or how, how we can um, you know help or how uh, how we, we can be helped, but also to uh, debate and to support uh, the ongoing initiative from the larger civil society and its stakeholders on coming 
working together uh, to protecting, preserving the food system, which might be uh, one of the uh, key uh, element and uh, uh, I think will be, uh, I would say, a uh, uh, right uh, tool on uh, mitigating some of the adverse effects of the climate change as in indigenous people has been doing a tremendous uh, effort or, you know, they been a very useful tool of their traditional indigenous knowledge and uh, food systems that they are carrying forward. So uh, I think we need a uh, crucial support on that. And for that, uh, I think some of the initiatives are really good. Just uh, was really uh, appreciate uh, to hear, uh, or I'm very happy to, glad to hear about the indigenous kitchen and also some of the uh, key things that's uh, mentioned by Jessica is also one of the, you know, good thing or, uh, you know, also the challenges that my colleagues have um, already explained. Uh, I think both are upon us. So it's, it's a time uh, for the world to look at, at the best part and to support at the uh, best part. So I think uh, we need to come together. That is the only solution. We need more efforts. We need more solidarity. We need more participation. This is where I think we, will, uh, we can overcome our barriers. And uh, as uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Yon has put on my introduction, the Himalayas, that's also one of the, I think, a uh, melting point for the humanity because you know uh, the mountains are melting. So indigenous peoples uh, trying to uh, preserve, trying to uh, help out uh, with uh, you know keeping the climate uh, climate cool. But as you know, the time we are getting food and a lot of uh, ecosystem uh, maintenance uh, there that the uh, Himalayan uh, are doing are also on the borders of extinction or you know in, a, in an adverse effect. Uh, so immediate attention should be put on that. And the indigenous people leaving them are also leaving there, also losing their livelihood. Uh, and also um, indigenous youth, uh, you know, uh, future is also in the stake. So I think not only the mountains are melting, but the hopes and aspiration and also. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, work or uh, the in the leadership of indigenous youth are melting. So I I urge all the governments, all the stakeholders to uh, think that, uh, this uh, indefinitely and uh, to take the urgent action to combat the climate crisis and also to protect the food system, which will be a, a key uh, for us uh, to to our sustainable and resilient planet, which we I believe we all want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. And we hope that the, that the climate change uh, spares the beauty of the Himalayas so that the, the snows of the Machapucharen can keep covering the rhododendron uh, forests in the lowlands and in the valleys. I see that my team is back. Thank you, Anish, and thank you, Jessica, for those words about the challenges. Uh, so let me thank, thank you very much, Jan, for the opportunity. It's, it's, uh, it's a really a pleasure uh, for being here. And yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. My team. See you. See you. Over to you, Sister My team. I see you, your connection is back. Thank you very much, Ion, um, for, uh, also for the help. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for the connection. Uh, it's really terrible tonight, but I'll try my best. Um, so um, next, uh, uh, we will move to the next session. Uh, it's which is more of a dialogue. So we've heard, uh, we listened to Sister Jessica and Brother Anish talking, uh, sharing us the issues, the challenges, and also the commitment which Indigenous youths are ready of. Um, so, um, and, and also I want, uh, at the beginning, uh, I mean, at the opening remarks, he highlighted a lot. And also Ambassador Miguel highlighted a lot on the importance of unity and working for the food systems transformation. So um, in this session, we will hear from our leaders. We move to uh, different regions um, and we will hear from the, ex uh, the experiences from the Pacific region, Africa region, and uh, from Europe. Um, so, uh, first, uh, we will listen to how can Indigenous youth and non-Indigenous youth learn from each other on each other's experiences to collaborate in promoting more sustainable and resilient food systems. Uh, so first, let us hear from our brother Malakai Johnson, uh, 
who is a Gorangorang and South Sea Island descendant. He's working with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation to help design a healthy water program and work on the Strong People's Strong Country Monitoring Program. Brother Malakai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, great discussions by everyone as well. So the question I've been given is uh, how can others support and safeguard Indigenous people's food systems? And here are my solutions. We must create an environment for success. The way to do that is for all parties to come together. Uh, a key to that is education and understanding the gaps and impacts of all parties involved. Uh, understanding that not all food systems will be the same in different areas of country. Firstly, I'll discuss uh, why it's important for non-Indigenous people to be educated. Uh, inside the knowledge lies the answer of sustainability. This could be environmental sustainability, cultural sustainability, and managing human use. Understanding your food knowledge systems gives answers to why things move, what's moving and what's, what's the impacts. From that, you can create a management plan regulating use activity. Uh, and inside a management plan lies the cultural protocols and inside protocols lies the laws and customs. And imbalance in knowledge can affect sustainability of the resource. There needs to be more investment in resources. Governments need to show leadership and political will. Value for Western science to be able to, is to be able to sit with Indigenous peoples and understanding them, and for Western science to sit with our equivalents. Uh, understanding and recognising as Indigenous people, we too have our own chief scientists and legislators. To safeguard requires all levels, regional, state and national governments to all be on board. The legislative needs to be able to sit with the Indigenous peoples too. And this is done through two-way exchange, legislative and grassroots. And the middle management needs to align themselves with the top and bottom. Moving on to why it's important to educate our own Indigenous people. Uh, educating our own circles of Indigenous peoples about the impacts of uh, like uh, health, economics, uh, education and employment problems. This is because there was a massive cut uh, in the umbilical cord from country and knowledge. Um, indigenous food systems represents mum and the climate change that's happening represents dad. And dad sets the mood or the, or the temperature in, in the house. And when he becomes angry, things heat up. And then there, there becomes an imbalance in the house. So the mum becomes unsettled and then she can't provide us with her food. Um, so when indigenous people have the ability to access country, it supports and safeguards their connection to country and food knowledge. Three keys to learn. We need all parties to understand, acknowledge and recognise. Understand the significance of Indigenous food systems to the Indigenous peoples and their communities. Understand the cultural values, cultural law and customs that Indigenous peoples have with their food systems. And to recognise that Indigenous peoples are the true traditional custodians of the land the sea, the air, the underground, all living and, and non-living things. Our governments need to commit and recognise the importance of co-governance and power sharing. To move forward, there needs to be legislative power for Indigenous people. Co-governance management plans need to be tailored for Indigenous peoples by Indigenous peoples. Management plans uh, put in, need to be put in place to safeguard Indigenous food systems. Examples of this in Australia are Indigenous land use agreements, also known as Ilua, and traditional use of marine resource agreements, also known as a Tamra. I'm going to share those links after my chat. This collaboration of Western science with traditional knowledge and traditional science is our future. It is about Indigenous peoples having a seat at the table and a voice, but it's also about global leadership and how we can work with others to help us in our way because it's the right way. We've always been a part of a balanced system. We are the custodians and carers to keep the balance in the system. Without us, the system becomes unbalanced and unhealthy. So for, for positive results, these projects need to be indigenous led. Now, my, before I finish, my takeaway messages are, we need to lead from the heart of indigenous people. There must be indigenous inclusiveness and leadership at a global level within the governance and the research 
And when engaging with Indigenous peoples in our Indigenous food systems, remember the three keys I mentioned, understand, acknowledge, and recognise. Because Indigenous food systems is a way of life. It's at the centre of our health, culture, and all things sustainable. Thank you for your time, guys. My name is Malachi Johnson. I hope I get to have the pleasure to see you all again. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Brother Malachi, uh, for the great uh, insights, for messages, um, understand, acknowledge, and recognize uh, the rights of Indigenous peoples, our knowledge systems for really meaningful uh, food systems transformation. So you also talked a lot about how resilient and how sustainable these knowledges are and the requirements uh, for this knowledge to really be workable uh, in the long run, uh, to maintain its sustainability and resiliency. Thank you so much for such a great message and for your wisdom. Um, so we'll move next to Africa. Uh, I would like to invite our brother Amos Yator, uh, who is an independent freelance researcher, data analyst and writer and who is also a part of Kip Kandule Code Area, KCA, a community-based youth group from Enboroi's community in Baringo County, Kenya. So uh, Brother Amos, so, um, how do you really see uh, this? Uh, so of course, uh, Brother Mark Hai already uh, shared his insights, uh, what are the needs uh, to be uh, done? to really make sure these systems uh, live. Um, so how do you see as a youth that uh, these indigenous uh, youth and non-indigenous youth can learn from each other and how they can work together um, from your experience? Uh, Brother Amos, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. I hope everybody's getting me. And uh, thank you, Brother Malakai, it's a great pleasure seeing you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to greet everybody who has attended this session to today. And I say good evening and uh, good afternoon. Yeah, in Kenya, it is evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to be attending this session today. So uh, as my brother said, uh, indigenous uh, food systems is a way of living. It is not actually agriculture or whatever it, uh, uh, other people may call it, but it is a way of life because uh, the indigenous people uh, do not struggle uh, to, in, a, in, a, in an ideal environment, they do not struggle to, uh, to maintain their food systems. But uh, uh, due to the changes, that have occurred uh, because of the dynamic world and technology and westernization and all those things, uh, the indigenous people have become vulnerable over time because they don't get the opportunity uh, to practice uh, their food systems as it were before. So I'm going to present uh, my uh, story on three, on four points actually. Uh, to, to demonstrate how the indigenous uh, youth and the non-indigenous youth can collaborate together to maintain uh, the food systems uh, of the indigenous people. One is, uh, I don't know if it is common knowledge that uh, most of the indigenous food systems or food products are mostly considered as non-popular and uh, old fashioned, some kind of. In my communities, this, that's the case. Like if you find someone taking uh, one of the products of maize, like uh, Tani has told us, uh, we have several ways of cooking maize. One of the products is, we call it ugali. That is, we cook from maize. If you get, some, you get someone taking that food, uh, it's like it's old fashions. People, people, people want to see uh, the westernized way of eating. So uh, I really acknowledge that. I really uh, think that the one of the ways that uh, the non-indigenous uh, youth and the indigenous youth can work together to preserve uh, 
the, the indigenous food system is by acknowledging and appreciating the indigenous people's culture and food systems. Uh, then an indigenous youth, uh, then an indigenous people should, uh, should encourage the structures that foster indigenous food systems in public and social spaces. This is even uh, an example is in schools and, uh, and other public uh, spaces. Uh, another point is, uh, I believe that the non-indigenous youth and the indigenous youth should uh, work together in carrying out research. My brother Malakai mentioned uh, the importance of research. Uh, most of the uh, indigenous food systems have least been explored through research because one, because of the language barrier and the uh, the level of illiteracy, especially in the uh, in the rural areas, like in my community, you find uh, most of the uh, of the old people they don't speak more than one language; they only speak the indigenous language, and that makes it uh, difficult to share uh, information or research information or to expose uh, the indigenous information. So uh, the indigenous and the non-indigenous youth could uh, undertake research and get the deeper understanding and appreciation of the indigenous food systems. So as uh, to publish and even uh, carry forward the knowledge to uh, future generations. Uh, my other point is uh, that uh, the indigenous, considering uh, the, the vulnerability that the indigenous uh, youth or the indigenous people have been exposed to due to the dynamic world, the introduction of technology and uh, just the dynamic world. Uh, the, the, the indigenous youth or the indigenous people are lagging behind in most of the communities, in most of the parts of the world in technology. And the non-indigenous youth and the indigenous youth should work together by embracing technology to share uh, information through photography, videography, audio recording, uh, I had asked some time back, I think uh, on first when this forum, uh, when the uh, WFF was launched, I asked Dion how the information could be collected from the indigenous people considering the literacy level. And uh, Yon asked me uh, very well and said that uh, we are embracing the audio or the verbal communication that is to, to, to store information. So this, uh, two combinations could work together by capturing the information through videography, uh, photography, and uh, even audio recordings. Site technology could foster uh, intergenerational sharing of information so that uh, the generations to come may not uh, lack information concerning uh, the indigenous food systems. I consider that the indigenous food systems are under a great threat because if I consider my community, uh, as people move to the urban areas, they drop the culture behind. And uh, you find that even the language is fading away. And without uh, incorporating the technology, then in future, we are having a, a, a tough uh, time to trace back uh, the indigenous cultures and the indigenous food systems. So I believe uh, technology would really work for the indigenous people. Finally, uh, as I also touch on what my brother Malaki Johnson uh, said, is concerning uh, the representation in the governance and uh, policy making. Uh, the indigenous people are vulnerable in leadership representation because uh, they are not considered uh, or they do not get the chance or they do not get the opportunity to get representation in the governance. And I believe that uh, the, the indigenous and the non-indigenous uh, uh, youth should advocate for equal representation of the indigenous youth. That is if the issues or the uh, plight of the indigenous food system or indigenous people food, food systems are to be addressed at the national level by, the, by setting policies and regulations that would favor uh, the preservation of the same. Uh, this would foster uh, the preservation of the indigenous people food systems, even in the coming generations. That is, if we have leadership that represents the youth system, the, uh, the, the indigenous people at the national level, 
that means uh, the, the, the plate of the indigenous people will be even aired at the in international level. I really believe that uh, there's still very less representation and there is still uh, less uh, awareness creation among the indigenous people and the cry, the outcry that should be actually had at the, at the, at the uh, global lab level. Finally, as I conclude, uh, I, I urge all of us as the indigenous people, as, you, as we meet uh, to, to this evening, that we strive towards salvaging our feeding culture and our indigenous food systems knowledge to preserve our identity and save our world. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Brother Amos, for sharing such uh, your very rich experiences and ideas. Thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to invite Ida, uh, Sister Ida Stromso, uh, who is the former FAO Indigenous Youth Focal Point and now finalizing her master's degree on seed security and policy coherence. Um, yeah, Ida, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, my team, and thank you to the organizers as well uh, for the opportunity to speak. It's very good to be back with the uh, old colleagues and all Indigenous friends uh, in this wonderful event. Um, I feel very, very honored to share the panel with uh, Brother Malachi and Brother uh, Amos, uh, who have all provided really important remarks. But to answer the question, I think I can use my position as the only non-Indigenous youth uh, in this uh, panel uh, to highlight some remarks based on my experiences working both with Indigenous youth in FAO, but also uh, as a former youth advocate for questions concerning uh, climate and sustainability. So I want to highlight a couple of points on how non-Indigenous and Indigenous youth can best work together, and especially for how non-Indigenous youth can support Indigenous youth um, in policy um, advocacy uh, and other really important work. Uh, so my first point is understanding uh, and acknowledging and recognizing, as Malachi put it, uh, which is the key, uh, which is the key uh, element of um, increasing our uh, ability to support Indigenous youth. I think it's uh, of key importance for non-Indigenous peoples to um, get into the understanding that Indigenous peoples have some of the most sustainable systems on the planet, as has been shown in the FAO publication, uh, mentioned by several here today. And um, we are all also living on the same planet. So we have to understand how we can stand in solidarity with each other. And very importantly for all non-Indigenous peoples is also to understand how the future of traditional Indigenous food systems, it large, largely depends on how we can uh, seize the systematic discrimination and marginalization of Indigenous peoples. And here we non-Indigenous peoples are often the people that are responsible for this marginalization and discrimination. Uh, so we have to uh, enhance our understanding of how we can uh, see this. And also, and has been mentioned by several here today, uh, Indigenous youth have a unique opportunity, um, capability of combining modern technology and traditional knowledge. And we also need to learn uh, from these uh, innovative practices that come out of uh, this combination. So how can we understand more of indigenous youth? We have to put much more time and effort into learning from indigenous youth, listening uh, to indigenous youth and understanding how we can contribute uh, to ending marginalization. Uh, and this can only be done if we invite Indigenous youth into the spaces where we are discussion, discussing uh, issues concerning them. From the point in time when I started working uh, with Indigenous peoples in FAO, it's been uh, a really huge journey for me as well, personally. And I have made a lot of mistakes along the way. But even though I have made these mistakes, we as non-Indigenous youth and non-Indigenous peoples have a responsibility to stay humble, open and uh, curious and listen to Indigenous peoples uh, and stay open to ch changing our knowledge and perspectives as well. 
because this is the only way that we can truly uh, learn from each other. And we also have to understand that our way is not the only way. For example, globalization and the prevalence of cash uh, income economies is often weakening indigenous people's food systems. Um, and also, as has been mentioned by Tanya, uh, Amos and Malachi, uh, we must learn how to value traditional knowledge alongside uh, scientific modern knowledge. So I want to just, before I finish, I want to say that um, it's uh, very promising that uh, youth in general seems to have a higher awareness of uh, issues concerning climate and sustainability. We can see this um, when it comes to the World Food Forum, uh, which is a huge mobilization of youth from across the, across the globe. Youth were also really active in the UN Food System Summit, and all this is really good. Um, but youth is not a homogenous group, and we have to uh, remember to bring in indigenous youth to ensure inclusion of a diverse set of voices, also in the youth constituency. And also, especially youth activists in the global north often have much more experienced resources and privileges, allowing them to take part in this uh, kind of activism which means that uh, youth advocates, we have to pave the way for indigenous youth voices and also ensure an exchange of training between well-connected youth networks uh, and indigenous youth groups. Because there are a lot of resources out there for uh, youth to do uh, political advocacy work. And we must, sure that, um, must make sure that indigenous youth can also access these resources. For example, in my own country, Norway, we have an organization uh, working with several indigenous communities in Latin America, where they have an equal exchange where they uh, send uh, non-indigenous youth from Norway to uh, these countries in Latin America and send uh, people from uh, Brazil, Guatemala and Colombia, indigenous youth to Norway, where we learn from each other's a way of organizing politically, how they uh, farm, how they work with different uh, elements of food systems. And such kinds of equal exchanges can be a good way uh, for non-indigenous youth and indigenous youth to continue to support each other, because that's the only way that we can actually uh, make more sustainable and resilient food systems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ida, um, for your uh, very insightful messages and part of this focal person anymore, but yeah, with your studies, you're still contributing a lot. And also thank you for your participation today and sharing your experience with us. Um, so um, it's, uh, I would like to announce that uh, in a very regretful <laughs> manner that uh, due to um, our, how should I say, delayed uh, time, uh, as we're running out of time, we'll just jump to the closing and musical intervention uh, session. Um, but please feel free to uh, type your, send your questions and comments in the chat box and which will be, uh, and which the speakers will be answered to you uh, directly through the message. Thank you so much for your understanding. As the closing session of the whole, um, will. Um, forum is starting soon. That's why we need to uh, jump more quickly. Um, so thank you so much, all the speakers again, uh, for your very uh, thoughtful sharings. Uh, I'm sure the participants, uh, uh, me personally, I've also learned a lot from our speakers today. Um, so uh, for the closing, for the musical contribution, I would like to uh, invite Kechiko, a singer and songwriter originally from Chisot, Comalapa, Guatemala, uh, among various recognitions obtained for her leadership. She was awarded as an Outstanding Woman of the Year 2021 by the Platform of Indigenous Women and the UN Women. Uh, Sister Kakigil, thank you. Um, the floor is yours. Anila Matias, 
Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Aquí en Guatemala es, es buenos días, recién está amaneciendo y pues me da mucha alegría poder sumarme con mi canto en esta reunión que nos convoca a reflexionar en torno a todos esos conocimientos que eh, resguardan nuestros pueblos, que resguardan también en este caso los jóvenes eh, para tener una soberanía alimentaria digna. Y en este caso, eh, mi música ha tenido ese papel también de acompañar y acuerpar eh, la lucha de las mujeres, de los hombres en resguardar las semillas nativas. Y creo que eso es un acto también muy importante que considero que, que, que nosotros como jóvenes debemos también conservar, que es ese conocimiento de, de guardar esas semillas que no sean transgénicas. Y bueno... Comentarles que en Mesoamérica los alimentos más sagrados que tenemos como pueblos es el maíz. Y bueno, voy a compartirles una canción dedicada al elemento fundamental. Mm. Somos los ciclos del tiempo, somos energía en movimiento, somos fuego, somos tierra, somos agua y somos viento. Venimos de pueblos con mucha historia, venimos hilando y trenzando nuestras vidas, somos raíz, somos de maíz, somos raíz, somos de maíz, somos raíz, somos de maíz, somos raíz, somos de maíz. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you so much, uh, sister, uh, for this very beautiful and also very uh, engaging performance. And this really reminds me of the power of youth um, uh, in uh, connecting ourselves to nature and our food system through different ways, very creative and very innovative ways. Thank you so much. And also for um, congratulations for the great award that you uh, truly deserve and received it. Thank you so much for 
uh, your contribution to the event. Um, so uh, now we move to the end of the session and uh, giving place to the closing remarks. First, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Frank Roy, uh, who is the coordinator of the Indigenous Partnership of Agrobiodiversity and Food Sovereignty and member of the Global Hub of Indigenous Peoples Food Systems. Um, Frank, the floor is yours. Frank, you're muted. Um. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Martin. I just returned last night from London where our 11-year-old grandson played the part of Michael Banks in the London musical, Mary Poppins. I told him that I would be attending a virtual global meeting of elders and young people. And I asked him, what would he as a preteen like to hear? He said, Pae, which is in my mother tongue grandfather, please tell them to stop too much of blah, blah, blah and instead take action so that young people can hope to inherit the future world that is not broken down. He is obviously more influenced by Greta Thunberg than all the wise talks that I can give. Indigenous youth who are here in today's meeting, you too can play an important role like Greta Thunberg. You too can help to shine a light on our neglected and marginalized indigenous food systems. You too can make our governments and international organi organizations to acknowledge that we can definitely contribute towards a more caring food system. The indigenous partnership that I run has a fellowship program where young people and young indigenous professionals visit an indigenous area before coming to Rome. Then they prepare a small project to work on when they return to their lands and territories. Mary Shia, one of our 2017 fellow in our review meeting said, she would prepare a rural project with rural youth as prime movers. We told her that indigenous youth are voting with their boots to be in urban centers and your idea seems a bit romantic. She agreed that many indigenous youth are leaving the rural areas, but she said there's still a small dedicated group of young people who are eager and determined to stay in the rural years, uh, areas. Three years later, Marisha and her group, group of young people played a major role in forcing the governor of Meghalaya to stop a hydro project that would have swallowed the rich biodiversity lands. The speakers in today's sessions are challenging us, our indigenous youth, to dare to be yourself, dare to be an indigenous youth who will promote, who will protect, who will revitalize indigenous food systems, both locally and globally. And to do this, we heard no that there are many who really like you as indigenous youth, associate with them and win their friendship, as Iwan Ming said. Choose what your indigenous upbringing and what you yourself think is right, and don't blindly copy social media and mainstream narratives. Remember the indigenous art of observing nature as our forefathers did, and as reminded by Tanya. Ask questions so that you too can make things work for you and your people. Indigenous knowledge, like any other knowledge system, has its blind spots. Have an open mind, as His Excellency Ambassador Miguel said, and learn to be flexible to be able to combine the wonders of culturally appropriate science with traditional insights and perspectives as Ida 
has also stated. And lastly, don't wait. Get into your indigenous people's food, land and territories and make things happen. At TIP, we are eagerly looking to work with passionate young people. If you're interested, contact us and let's build our network through the global hub that we have created so that we can be make a difference for the world we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, for that very powerful message um, and also for uh, spotlighting the power of youths um, and also for your offer uh, to work together. And um, also thank you for your great uh, achievement in um, creating space and learning space for Indigenous youth so far. And we are very much looking forward to your mentorship to the emerging uh, young leaders of Indigenous peoples. Thank you so much. Um, uh, next, I would like to um, invite uh, Marcela Villario, uh, PhD and Director of FAO Partnerships and UN Collaboration Division. Um, Marcela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It's indeed a pleasure to be here with you today. I'll be very brief uh, because uh, we're already eating into the closing ceremony that I know everybody wants to attend. I think we heard today very, very powerful messages. We heard very powerful messages of possibilities, of opportunities, of the drive of indigenous youth that we all have heard from you on the, on the ability to change the agendas. We also heard very clear indications with very good proposals as to uh, clear elements of a path forward, yeah. what can be done, what can be done so that indigenous uh, people's food systems really are listened to, are listened to in an equal way, um, are part of the discussion uh, with uh, non-indigenous uh, uh, systems of knowledge. Uh, a lot can be done. We heard it from you. Uh, create uh, management uh, plans of sustainability. Um, have dialogues between Indigenous youth and in non-Indigenous youth. Um, many, many things can be done. But I think that Frank's uh, message was very clear. Um, you have the power. Indigenous uh, youth, uh, you have the power. And uh, it is uh, necessary for you to make your voice be heard. Uh, from our side, from the point of view of FAO and from the point of view of uh, in international organizations, what we need to do is to ensure that that space happens. And from FAO, we commit to creating this space as much as you want it, as much as you want us to within the possibility of our, our means. And then we also heard very clear uh, uh, advice towards governments. What do governments need to do? So we heard about policies for interculturality. We need to have quick policies, urgent policies to help um, avoid the loss of indigenous uh, people's languages. Uh, as Jan said, uh, that uh, indigenous uh, knowledge uh, transmission is uh, being slowed at an alarming rate. So we need to have the policies, the enabling environment for that to happen, because if not, we know that it's gonna to be too late uh, for the world to be able to uh, benefit from indigenous peoples, not only knowledge and knowledge systems and the ancestral knowledge systems, but from indigenous peoples power to influence the agenda, to be able to influence the climate change agenda uh, at a time when we heard uh, from the Himalayas that that they're actually melting, it's the climate is actually melting uh, the environment, not only the Himalayas, we know also in the Arctic. So that power is, again, uh, what will carry forward the agenda. And we have a great opportunity with the food systems uh, coalition that is uh, coming up, uh, whereby uh, from our side, we commit to ensure we put in what is necessary for that coalition to be able to bring together not only your voices, but your energy, your innovative ideas, as we have heard uh, today, and the drive that you bring to change the planet and make it better for all. Thank you. Over to you, Maiten.
I think we lost my team again. Uh, she's having a terrible difficulties today with the connection. Let me check very quickly if she's reconnecting, but I think we just lost her. So please indulge me and, uh, and let us move on with the closer remarks from the, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Anthony Simpson from the New Zealand. Ambassador, you have the floor and apologies for the technical difficulties. Over to you. No problem. Um, thank you, Jon. Uh, excellencies, representatives of Indigenous Peoples, panelists and other participants, um, let me say as someone who is, is not of Indigenous heritage and unfortunately can't make many claims to youth uh, anymore these days, um, what an honour it's been to join today's discussions, um, to listen to so many wonderful speakers and, and to learn from your wisdom and experience. All farmers are connected to the land, but as we've heard today, the bonds between Indigenous communities and their lands are, are truly profound. In New Zealand, the Indigenous Māori people call themselves tangata whenua, the people of the land. The, the fields and the rivers and the mountains of their ancestral territories are, are central to their personal identity. Indigenous communities have buried generations of their ancestors and their lands. They, they've relied on the health and the fertility of their soil and the preservation of their natural resources for survival over many centuries. So given this profound connection, it's, it's obvious that Indigenous peoples have a central place in the discussions on global food systems. As my Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern stated during last month's Food Systems Summit, Indigenous knowledge, participation and leadership is essential for achieving more sustained and resilient food systems and attaining global uh, and ending global hunger. Today's discussions have highlighted why this is so important. The impacts of climate change, of the COVID-19 pandemic and of biodiversity loss are exacerbating existing inequalities. And the Food Systems Summit highlighted the need to broaden our perspectives and look at these challenges in the context of the entire food system. But of course, this isn't a new idea at all. Indigenous peoples have, have always understood the interconnectedness between people and prosperity, between health, culture and environment. So the understandings that we need already exist. The problem has been that those who possess these understandings have simply not had a seat at the table. As we've heard today, Indigenous youth have a particularly critical contribution to make um, in, in these discussions. Youth are the bridge over which our traditional values, knowledge and understandings cross into the future. But as, as a number of speakers have mentioned, they're also a source of new energy and ideas that can strengthen and revitalize traditional food systems, building on the values and practices of those who went before them. Today's discussions have highlighted the tremendous value and leadership that Indigenous models can bring to meeting our shared global challenges and the particular importance of Indigenous youth perspectives and involvement. They've also highlighted the value of sharing experiences and working together to support Indigenous food systems. So in this regard, New Zealand has been really honoured to participate in the newly formed Indigenous Peoples Food Systems Coalition. Um, this coalition represents, in our view, um, a really important opportunity to work together to foster interculturality, the co-creation of knowledge and understanding and respect for Indigenous Peoples food systems. I'd like very briefly just to share a couple of projects New Zealand is contributing to, which are intended to, to help empower Indigenous partners and support Indigenous youth. Through the Global Research Alliance, which is a, a grouping that New Zealand's um, particularly active in, uh, we're working to promote Indigenous research, draw on Indigenous connections and empower Indigenous youth in the fight against climate change. And there's two specific projects that have a, a focus on young people in particular. The first is about empowering young people. It's a, it's a scholarship, an undergraduate scholarship known as the Whakatohea Undergraduate Scholarship, which enables young Māori to undertake research exchanges with other Indigenous youth around the world. We've heard today that Indigenous youth face many barriers that often exclude them from, from vital conversations around food systems. So this scholarship is intended to address some of those barriers. The other project with a particular focus on youth is a group called um, Kohimarama, which means the gathering place of light. Um, it's a group which takes an indigenous whole of systems approach to climate change resilience in their, their respective communities. Uh, Kohimarama is in my view, a, a really good demonstration of the potential of indigenous research and projects. It seeks to empower indigenous youth to be key agents of change 
employing social, economic, cultural, and environmental impact analysis, but drawing also on Matauranga, the traditional Māori knowledge base that has been developed over generations. So these are just a couple of ways in which we can learn from Indigenous communities and empower Indigenous peoples, particularly Indigenous youth, to lead us in tackling the many changes facing our global food systems. So again, let me thank you for letting me join you for this really interesting and stimulating and educational discussion today. Thank you. Ambassador Anthony, thank you so much for those words. Uh, thank you for all the lead and the support that you have provided to the creation of the Coalition on Indigenous People's Food Systems. So I see my, my team is not connected. So I would like to then, if you allow me on behalf of, uh, of my team to, to start closing the meeting, I would like to thank the interpreters. They've been interpreting this, uh, your words into six languages. Um, and they have been working uh, longer than the expected time to support this work. And I would like to ask all of you to please turn on your camera uh, so that we can take a group photo. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Maria Costa and Luisa Castaneda for all the work they've been doing, as well as our audiovisual colleagues that have made this event possible. Indigenous youth, you've been fundamental on the work on Indigenous youth, and we don't forget you and the work you have done. But also Jessica, Ayana, and uh, uh, Maria. Uh, so it's a great honor to have you all with us. So please turn on your camera. Uh, you put um, with, in melody many of the insights of the discussions today, and you did it in a beautiful way. So thank you so much. So let us take a group photo. Uh, Maria, uh, I don't know if you can, uh, if you're with us, if you could turn your camera. And, and I see also Ros Rosella. And let us move uh, to the closer ceremony. We hope to see you soon. And you know that uh, you can count on, on we started in 2017, uh, working together to find avenues of work and dialogue for indigenous youth. Blessings to you and to your communities, and thank you so much for finding time to be with us today. Thank you so much. And thank you to my team that unfortunately is not here with us uh, virtually, but sees spiritually with all of us. Thank you so much, colleagues. Gracias. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Cheers, guys. Catch us later. Catch you, Amos.